today it's our pleasure to 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 welcome uh, Mr. Khoja as he's going to talk about data management and model development for autonomous vehicles. Uh, Abu Ziyad, uh, the floor is yours. Everyone who, who organized and has been working hard to, to organize this event. Uh, it's a real pleasure and um, any um, maybe privileged uh, from, from being at the seat at the ministry of seeing like all the development and changes that are happening in the kingdom, which is very exciting. So if you tuned in into the Saudi Green Initiative uh, that started on Saturday and ended with the Middle East Green Initiative yesterday, you've seen a lot of announcements um, that are very exciting. And, and I'm sure today and over the next uh, three days, we'll hear more interesting announcements from the Future Investment uh, Initiative as well. Um, so with that being said, uh, today our topic is about autonomous vehicles. Um, if, you, if you allow me, I'll quickly introduce kind of my, my experience uh, overall, which, which Dr. Khaled kindly alluded to already, and then we'll get into the topic, getting into the overview and the agenda. So firstly, about me, as Dr. Khaled mentioned, I got my electrical engineering degree from, from Purdue University. Uh, it was focused on uh, digital signal processing and communications. Uh, and after that, I started my career at Saudi Aramco. So I started as a data networks engineer, uh, moved around between various areas like uh, Upcake, uh, Sheba, uh, Lahran, of course. Uh, and then I was loaned or seconded by Aramco to the Saudi government, in particular, the Ministry of Energy to work on the Saudi Energy Efficiency Program. So if you see like all the energy efficiency labels on appliances, or if you're buying a, a vehicle, you can see the fuel economy standards. Uh, or if you're in the uh, industry, you can see uh, also targets on uh, industries in cement, steel, and petrochemical plants. Uh, after that, I went on to pursue my, my master's degrees. Um, so my master's, there's where my AI work started. Um, I started focusing on computer vision, deep learning, reinforcement learning, uh, and many other uh, methods uh, that, that were quite exciting to learn about, but more exciting to apply in various areas. Uh, I've also gotten the opportunity to, to work at a few places uh, while I was in the US. So whether it was AI startups or also even intern at Amazon to use uh, deep learning for last mile technology. But after graduation, I worked at NVIDIA uh, to develop uh, autonomous vehicles and self-driving cars. So I was working on NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA's AI infrastructure team as a product manager before I came back and returned to the ministry, which is where I am today, to lead the AI team, digital transformation and innovation. Uh, so most of my experience will be built on NVIDIA, uh, my experience at NVIDIA and also um, I mean, just from reading and, and looking at interesting reports in the autonomous vehicle landscape. So that being said, so what's our agenda today? I'll quickly take you over an overview, um, quick, taking a quick glimpse at the history of autonomous vehicles. Uh, and then I will focus more, mostly on the AV development cycle and data management. Because uh, as you might imagine, there are a lot of challenges there. Uh, and of course, we'll get to the AV models or autonomous vehicles models. So just to clarify, if I say AV, I am referring to autonomous vehicles. Uh, and lastly, we'll have some closing thoughts um, and um, hopefully we'll have some time for questions uh, either through the Q&A or if the other panelists have questions. So let's start with the overview and a bit of history. So when did autonomous vehicles start? So in, in or, or where did it start? In my research, interestingly, uh, it actually were some findings that uh, Leonardo da Vinci actually started building autonomous vehicles, like a mechanical cart that could go back and forth. But realistically, I think the modern day autonomous vehicle started with the DARPA challenge, which we probably all heard about. And it started in 2004 with a challenge of uh, having uh, multiple teams compete over a grand prize of $1 million to travel a distance of, I think it was 130 miles in the desert. Uh, now, as you can see in front of you, it, uh, 2004 was not probably a good year for all of the contestants. None of them were able to finish the race, uh, so none of them actually received the price. Um, I think the furthest car traveled only about seven or nine miles before it got stuck over a rock. So that's not even 10% of the total distance uh, that was in the competition. Uh, however, uh, the year, exactly one year after that, there was the second version of the DARPA challenge. And there, I think about 24 contestants were able to complete the course. Uh, and it was quite impressive. I mean, if we think about it, the amount of development that happened in one year to go from no one being able to finish the course 
to I, I think 24 being able uh, to finish the course. Uh, so I think that's when the revolution started for autonomous vehicles that was as we know it today, because just by looking at the logos, you can see um, it brought together private sector, it brought together uh, investors, it brought together uh, research and academia, uh, also car manufacturers. And this is, I mean, uh, those working in academia and research know this more than I do, but these are the key components or this type of collaboration is what helps realize research and turn it into reality. Um, and we, we all know and see the development happening in AVs today. So if you fast forward to, let's say, 2015, and uh, this is the, the, the time when Tesla first uh, launched their autopilot, but the interesting thing about the launch was that they did it over a software update. So it really revolutionized the way we interact with vehicles and the way also people that own vehicles uh, can expect uh, like as a consumer and their relationship with their vehicle. So it, essentially that means that the person that owned a Tesla went to bed the night before and their car couldn't drive itself and then woke up to find that their car all of a sudden could drive itself only through a software update. Now, obviously there are some caveats on what level of autonomy is Tesla actually achieving versus what they're marketing and, and whatnot. But uh, I, I would say that the point holds that first of all, they were able to do it over a software update. And then second, uh, that uh, the, the car was still able to do some, um, any, some, some abilities related to uh, autonomous vehicles, which was quite exciting. And we're seeing developments in this field every day. So if we look at the landscape of autonomous vehicles, and this is a bit older from 2019, and in the following slide, I have a newer version in, from 2020, and I'm sure every year we see uh, something similar to this. And each time I sh I'll actually go to the 2020 slide, and each time I, I show these slides, the thing I care about uh, highlighting is that we see startups popping up in every aspect of autonomous vehicles. Um, so whether it is from software or hardware, whether it is from LiDAR sensors to, let's say, for example, analytics, whether it is from mapping uh, or something else, any there, the, the problem is so big that there are multiple entry points to come and create value and try to solve uh, challenges within the field of autonomous vehicles. And obviously, uh, each year we see some consolidation, either some startups die out or other startups get acquired uh, by, by, by someone else or a bigger player. So for example, we saw how Zooks was acquired by Amazon, I think uh, sometime this year or maybe um, at the end of last year. And, uh, and there are many similar acquisitions that are happening. So consolidation is natural, uh, especially in a field like this, but still the point holds that there is, this is such a big problem uh, with enough room and space for people to enter it from multiple areas or angles to create value. So with that, I conclude my overview uh, on autonomous vehicles, and now we'll delve more into a bit of the technical aspects of the autonomous vehicle development cycle, and then we'll talk about data management and models. So let's start with the development cycle. So uh, I mean, you have your autonomous vehicle, and one of the big challenges is the number of steps that you need to take before you can deploy uh, your autonomous vehicle. So you obviously need to collect data, then um, you need to select which data from the raw data samples that you've collected, you want to start labeling. Um, you then spend time on labeling that data, whether drawing bounding boxes or, or, uh, or pixels or whatever. Uh, and then you start developing your models. And then after your models, you start testing them. And then finally, you deploy those models. So you can see it requires multiple steps multiple uh, checks and, and gates. And the main reason for that is obviously because we care a lot about safety. We're not gonna launch an autonomous vehicle that is let's say half cooked uh, without having proper testing or at least some guardrails in place. And we have also seen and heard about accidents that still happened and caused fatalities despite having all of these safeguards in place. Now, there's another dimension that exponentially increases the complexity of autonomous vehicle development. Because uh, if I, for example, just stopped here and removed the word AV from the slide and removed this car, um, this is a very generic cycle that could apply to any AI 
development uh, project, right? But uh, what makes this very complex is also the sheer size of data that you're handling. So uh, in, at NVIDIA, we're collecting data at a rate of petabytes per month. Uh, so that's thousands of, of, of terabytes. And then you end up having a lake that ranges between 10 to 100 petabytes of raw data. And this is raw data meaning that um, it's not labeled. You cannot yet use it for AV model development. Uh, so that's why you send it to a, lab uh, a labeling factory. Um, we used to have a, a team of a thousand data labelers that would uh, you know, produce millions of labeled images uh, each month. Uh, and we call that team the data factory because it essentially operated like a factory and they were labeling the data. Then you would have to develop models. You have a team of hundreds of developers and then thousands of GPUs in your clusters to do this. Uh, and it still takes a lot of time. Some models take up to two weeks to fully train on a full data set, right? Uh, even if they're training on eight GPUs, they might take two weeks to train. Once you're done with that, you start testing the model um, either on thousands of hours of video or testing it uh, also on simulated da data so you can create more, uh, let's say, rare scenarios that might not be captured in, in real videos. Uh, and then finally, you, you deploy it and test it on the, in the wild or on the roads and, and see how your car performs. And um, the cycle continues. You go back to square one. Uh, so then you can uh, close the, the feedback loop and then continue to update your model. So that's essentially the development cycle for uh, AVs. And again, if I were to summarize this, I would say that the complexity lies in the number of steps um, that you need to take in order to ensure the safety and robustness of the models. Uh, and then also the sheer size that adds to the complexity of managing all of this. So now let's zoom in to data management. Uh, I, I spoke very briefly about data collection and and labeling and whatnot, but let's start taking those kind of pieces bit by bit and focusing on, on those. So let's start with data collection. And uh, let's ask the simple question of how is data collected or what type of data do we collect? So obviously in an autonomous vehicle, in a generic sense, you can have uh, LIDAR units, you can have cameras, you have radar sensors, um, and obviously you have your uh, computer processing unit uh, in the trunk or somewhere in the vehicle. So that's a lot of data, but how much data is it exactly? And for that, I found this very interesting image um, that estimates that in one day, an autonomous vehicle could capture about four gigabytes, which is roughly four terabytes of data each day. Um, so if you think about it, the average person probably consumes, I don't know, like um, your, your data plan is what, two gigabytes, four gigabytes a month? for you as an average person. So, so sorry, there, there's feedback and echo. OK, so, uh, so you can imagine that uh, 4,000 gigabytes per day is probably equal to the consumption of 1,000 people, uh, the amount of data that 1,000 people consume in one month. So it's, it's a lot of data and information. And you can see how quickly we, we end up having petabytes of data uh, each month. So let's talk about the methodology of how autonomous vehicles collect that data using those sensors. So at least from my experience, there, there are two ways that I want to share today. There's the method that we use at NVIDIA. And uh, that way is uh, uh, where you have a fleet of vehicles and then you have a dispatch team or scheduling team that says, uh, um, for, for, for this week, for example, I want to send my vehicles to Europe or I want to send them in Japan. Uh, this week, I want to collect more data, let's say, in school districts, uh, or I want to collect more data at night. Uh, or this week, if it's raining, please send more vehicles because we need more data that captures rain. So let's call this more of a direct method where we collect data and you have uh, a fleet of vehicles that you control and send out to collect data. Now, the other method that is very exciting is what Tesla is doing. And Tesla is actually leveraging the cars that they are already selling to their customers. So by that note, they probably have over half a million vehicles uh, driving uh, around the world, right? And what they do is that as you're, as you're driving your vehicle, normally maybe driving from work, uh, from, from your home to work or and back, maybe dropping off your kids at school, going to the mall and whatnot, the car is recording your journey. 
And, uh, and then once you return home, it connects to Wi-Fi and then uploads that data in an anonymized way um, where it doesn't reveal who you are, but it just sends that data um, back to Tesla and it's centralized and then they can use it to develop their models. Uh, I'm guessing also that as you buy a Tesla, you have a function where, uh, or sign something that says that uh, you agree to sending data that would be used for product development at Tesla. Um, but this way, they kind of like outsource the idea of data collection to all of Tesla owners, which I think is very smart and is a big reason of why Tesla is probably leading the race in autonomous vehicles. The main thing is because uh, the difficulty in autonomous vehicles is catching what we call the long, long tail Apologies. Catching the long tail examples, uh, like for example, if we're driving from Riyadh to Eastern Province, or or vice versa, it's it's it might be likely that you that you encounter a camel on the road, right? But this is a very rare example, and doesn't happen every day, and doesn't happen to everyone. So if I were to control a fleet of let's say thirty or fifty cars, like Nvidia does, I cannot just tell them go and try to find camels on the on the road. But Tesla has the advantage of doing that. And they actually tag instances that are very rare. Uh, so then those are treated very specially as uh, data examples that would be uh, used to increase the robustness of their models. OK, so we talked about data collection. Now let's talk about data selection or curation. And that means like when I have a, a 10 to 100 petabytes of data, how do I know which data examples I need to label because those are the examples that would increase the uh, robustness or accuracy of my model. Uh, I just want to do a quick time check. Dr. Khalid, are we good on time? I have about 20 minutes. OK, OK, great. So I'll try to, 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 to move a bit quicker to finish in 10.15, and about then we can have more to questions. The audience, uh, uh, for questions, uh, everybody, please type in your questions, and we will. We will ask them later. Please go ahead, Abu Ziyad. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. OK, so to select data, I always like to put this slide up, so, uh, which you can see here. OK, so without cheating and zooming or looking closer into the screen, I want you to tell me which of these images has, let's say, a person crossing the road. Which of these images, let's say, is in an urban environment versus, let's say, a highway. Uh, which of these images, let's say, are taken during a clear day versus rain, and so on and so forth. Essentially, you're seeing the challenge with having a lot of data and not knowing which of these you should choose to train your model in the best way. Now, uh, obviously, I'm revealing to you that, okay, here are the four images. I used the same four images and just created a large grid. And you can see that here, this image was clearly at night, but you probably did not catch that there was a person riding a bicycle in the middle of the road. Or probably you didn't see, you saw here the pedestrian crosswalk, but maybe you didn't see that this guy uh, is wearing these interesting stints and he's trying to cross the road. Or that this trailer is pulling in an a a ATV uh, in the back. So uh, all of these, again, are rare instances that are helpful to train your model. So this is why data selection is a big challenge. So how do we deal with that? Uh, so to select the data that matters the most, I've seen three approaches. Uh, the first one is obviously metadata, right? So when you collect uh, data, you have timestamps, you have, let's say, GPS signals, you, uh, you have uh, GPS locations, and you can essentially know from that some valuable information, whether uh, this data was collected at night versus during the day, or whether this data was collected, uh, let's say, in an urban area versus a highway or at least let's say the general location in which country or geographical region it was in. The other thing is that you can enrich your data by pairing it with uh, third party data. So the most common thing is pairing it with, let's say uh, mapping data, like you see here. Uh, and that way I have more information out of my GPS locations that I've stored. Uh, you can also pair it with weather data, right? So using the timestamp, if, if I pair this with the weather database, I can know whether during this time it was raining or it was cloudy or it was a clear day or it was snowing and, what, and so, so on and so forth. And that in itself uh, adds the metadata that I have uh, in my raw data, which allows me to curate and select in a better way. 
the more interesting approach, which is an, which is an active area of research, uh, and NVIDIA was looking really hard into this, is active learning, right? Now, what we do with active learning is that we actually start with um, the data that we already have in store and, and train a model uh, using it. And then we pass the raw data on that model that was trained, trained with the old data and see which data points um, kind of, um, oh, which, which examples does the model fail in the most? And then we use those examples to, and take those to labeling. So then we can train our model there. Because essentially what you're trying to say is uh, let me find out from the raw data I have the examples that cause my model to fail. And then I will take those raw data examples and label them and then train my model using them because I believe those would increase the accuracy and performance of my model. So let's look at an example. Um, so when I have training data, this is the data I typically have. On the left, you see the screen. And this is essentially a model that I developed this is uh, labeled data that I've created using this image to essentially detect the lanes uh, on the road. So this is now my trained data and I trained the model on it. And then I would pay, if I collect more data, let's say tomorrow, I would uh, use my trained model that I trained today to look at that data. And if I do that, you can see that, okay, my model probably performed well on this new example that it sees of raw data, because you can see it sees the lanes here but here you can see that the model is, is not performing very well, right? It's not very confident of the locations of the lanes. And then it has these predictions in the middle of the road. And then there's something going on here on the side. So uh, you don't have very much confidence. So in this, in this uh, instance, I would say, OK, I will choose this example to take it to labeling. Because once I label it and use this example to train my model, it would help my model increase performance. So allow me to move faster. I'll quickly go through la labeling data because it's a bit straightforward. So when we label, we have many projects, whether it's a uh, LiDAR point clouds, whether it's uh, uh, semantic segmentation, obviously video object tracking, traffic light and object detection and so on and so forth. Now, uh, you've heard me mention that we had a data factory of a thousand people and to ensure standards and quality, you need to have a set of instructions. So here's an example of instructions that you would give to your labeling team to know like how to draw bounding boxes, what does a correct example look like and what does a wrong example look like. Now with that, we conclude the data management part. So let's get to AV models and development. Um, excuse me if I'm, I'm going a bit quickly because I, I do want to leave time for you to ask questions uh, as well. Uh, so with AV models, um, and he, the question becomes, what types of models do we need to develop, right? Um, so typically you see actually in an autonomous vehicle, um, uh, tens of different types of models that perform different tasks. So you have some models performing object detection. You have some models performing semantic segmentation. You have models performing classifying road signals. And you also have uh, kind of models predicting motion of let's say pedest pedestrians and other vehicles. And in the following slides, I'll, I'll share some examples of some models I've seen, uh, and also what are the challenges of each type of model. But the thing is, the reason you have tens of models operating, because each one is predicting a different factor, and that then creates a signal for you uh, to plan your route. So you always see in an autonomous vehicle, you have something called the perception stack or the um, essentially the perception stack, and then you have the path planning stack, which is essentially the control systems of uh, a uh, set of actuators and, uh, and let's say, uh, to, to essentially control the path of the vehicle and how it accelerates, decelerates, and, and moves uh, left or right. So looking at obstacle detection, um, obviously the data needed is you will take a raw image and then create bounding boxes to it and, and obviously add classes for each bounding box. So here you can see that some boxes in light blue are pedestrians, boxes in red are traffic lights. And the boxes in uh, uh, here are for vehicles. And the reason you see different colors, we used to call these not 2D and not 3D, we used to call them 2.5D because they're essentially in 2D, but the colors kind of tells you which, where is the front of the vehicle, where is the left side, the right side, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the, the challenge here is how do you create a model that accurately detects objects that are far away? So they would be very small in size in the image and objects that are very close. So these cars, this one and this one are probably the same size. 
But obviously, when you look at them in the camera, uh, it would be very difficult to try and manage, um, kind of detect both with, with high accuracy. You can see that there are probably some cars here in the distance that are not being detected. OK. Now, to the next one is traffic sign. Now, the, um, the challenge here, it's similar to the previous one, obviously. But the challenge is that you have hundreds of signs. And uh, it's not hundreds of signs uh, in just the US, because if you, you want your autonomous vehicle to operate in multiple geographies, let's say you are Mercedes or you're Toyota, your cars are everywhere. They're not just in the US. They're in Japan. They are in Saudi Arabia. They're in, in Europe. They're in the US. So each area probably has different road signs, right? So our road signs in Saudi here are written in Arabic. Um, so the autonomous vehicle needs to understand all of this. Uh, so that leads to having a big challenge with hundreds of classes. The way we would do it is that you would actually have, let's say, uh, some progressive prediction in the sense that, OK, if the, if the sign is, let's say, circular, then that's probably a speed limit. And then you would detect that it's a speed limit sign, but then you would try to detect, is it a speed limit that says 60 or something else? Uh, the other type of model is path perception. So here, uh, we obviously try to tell the car where it should kind of drive. So you can see these green arrows that tells it, okay, you can drive here in the middle of the road, or here's the middle of the road, and the car should be in this uh, kind of trying to, to follow this line. Uh, and also, it tries to tell it uh, where, whether to it, it's safe to take do a line uh, a lane shift or a lane switch and switch lanes. The challenge here was curves in the road, right? Because uh, especially if you're exiting a highway or if you're entering a highway or so, you you take those let's say round robin roads, and uh, it gets very difficult for the car to see around the corners or at least predict what's around the corner because it doesn't see it yet. Uh, compared to a human driver. And that's the challenge here. The last part is motion detection. Uh, and here, obviously, it's a time series uh, prediction. You're trying to predict where are the cars or also the pedestrians going to move. Uh, and you can see that the yellow box indicates the future predictions. Uh, so the challenge here is that this requires a lot of data, which leads to large training times. So now we reach the, the end of the presentation, and then I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, as for closing, um, what I want to say is in AVs, uh, there are actually a lot, a lot of new jobs that are being created. I've spoken about the data labelers having a thousand data labelers. Uh, and also, you obviously have a lot of technicians that work into, uh, let's say, calibrating the sensors on the vehicle and maintaining the vehicles and whatnot. The other thing is, uh, I hope you kind of got a better glimpse or I was able to kind of show you that the scale of AV development makes it a big challenge. So it's not just about uh, the life cycle of development, but also uh, handling petabytes of data. How do you store it? How do you make it accessible to your model developers? Um, so one thing probably I didn't share is what we used to do when we send our cars at NVIDIA to collect data is they would collect the data on a hard drive on the vehicle. And then those hard drives would be FedExed back to a central location. And then it gets uploaded into a cluster. Uh, and then it gets put into the data lake and whatnot. So it's actually a process that is not very quick and smooth and, and fast. Uh, and then how do you allow your model developers that are from around the world, essentially, to access that data and develop? And lastly, uh, I always like this, it's a clear problem without a clear answer. So we always say, yes, we want to develop a car that drives itself. And that, that is quite clear what you're wishing for. But how do I deliver that? How do we build that is not yet clear. Uh, and the reason why I use that statement is because often people think of this as, oh, Tesla is doing it this way. So Tesla's way must be right. Or Waymo at Google is doing it that way. So their way must be right. But as you've seen from the landscape slide, everyone is trying a different approach. And no one is yet a clear winner. Uh, so the, the jury is still out. And uh, if you have a new approach, a new idea that you would like to test out, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Thank you very much for following. I've put my personal email here. And you can follow me on Twitter if you use Twitter. Um, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for this opportunity once again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yahya. Uh, 
very interesting talk. So we have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, apologies to the audience that I might not be able to take all questions, but I'll do my best to cover as many as possible. Okay, so uh, we have the SE club, that's our department student club is asking, as we know, there was a lack of production in semiconductors this year. Uh, how will this affect the future of AVs? Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, it would definitely impact the future of AVs. Uh, but uh, and you have see, uh, during my year at NVIDIA, I've seen already a few cycles that kind of cost Mark um, any, let's say, some shocks in the availability of GPUs. Uh, but I think it's it's kind of like a cyclical nature. Uh, I don't know. I would presume that this shortage would eventually end and then they become more available once again. Uh, or like manufacturers find a way to kind of produce them more efficiently. Um, I think what happened is that during COVID-19, it caused a big surge in uh, kind of uh, the requirements of semiconductors and with all the machinery that was produced and then testing equipment and whatnot for COVID-19. And that's what caused the shock in the market. And eventually, like many markets, they would eventually reach an, a new equilibrium, let's say, maybe not the old one, and then any markets will, will go back. But I, I would say that's essentially why you start seeing the NVIDIA GPUs getting more and more expensive. Um, but but I, I, I think it, it will fix itself eventually. So, so generally, to what extent they got more expensive? The, the price well, uh, at least at least the gaming ones, uh, like the GTX GPUs, um, and so the three thousand series, I think, is probably two times, three folds more expensive than what it was before. Uh, and I, I hear customers kind of obviously, no one likes to see the price of their products go up. Um, like if the iPhone next year was twice as expensive, I don't think people would be very happy, but some people would still buy it, right? Yeah. I see. So uh, Jalal is asking uh, how does the customers manage to send four terabyte uh, data to the company daily? Yeah, so uh, so that's a great question. Uh, I don't have a definitive answer, right? Because I don't know at first hand, but here's my guess. Uh, so first of all, what I've seen from Tesla, and like I said, they don't take all of the data. So they're not taking the full recording of your video. Like the bulk of the four terabyte produced each day is, as, you, as we've probably seen in the slide, is uh, camera data and LiDAR data. So I don't think they take all of it, or at least in raw format. They kind of take masks of the data, which or compressed versions of the data, uh, which would then reduce the amount of data being uh, sent to them. Uh, and then obviously, again, they depend on the car uh, connecting to your Wi-Fi, so using essentially your your uh, your home Wi-Fi to to upload that data back to Tesla's central location. Okay, yeah. In the interest of time, this will be the maybe the last question. Uh, so Ahmed Hambali is asking: AV are very are every year improving in performance and capabilities. Uh, can you please update us on the legal issues related to accident responsibility? Is it the car owner, the manufacturer's responsibility, or the software developers responsibility yeah i mean this is a very interesting question uh and unfortunately again not a definitive answer and i like this question why because i always tell people that av is so big and so huge of a problem that it requires everyone's participation we don't just need uh, technical people or uh, deep learning developers or software engineers that just develop them we need uh, uh, lawyers, we need uh, social scientists, we need economists uh, that think about other aspects that let's say um, maybe a deep learning engineer might not be the best person to kind of make that decision or think about that uh, question, right? Uh, so, and, and then the example I, I always like to think about is the Uber incident, right? So the Uber incident, if you haven't heard of it, um, uh, the autonomous vehicle unfortunately kind of ran over a, a woman crossing the road and it caused the fatality of that woman, right? But then there, the, the story is more complex, right? The complexity is that the woman was crossing the road, not from a pedestrian crosswalk. So essentially she, she was jaywalk, jaywalking and, and breaking the law. The autonomous vehicle had a safety driver in it and that person was distracted. So the safety dri driver should have stopped the car. So essentially, whose fault is it uh, or who's to blame? Is it the woman that broke the law and crossed the road from 
from a non-pedestrian crosswalk? Is it the safety driver who was in the vehicle and should have stopped it but didn't? Is it the model developers or Uber who developed the autonomous vehicle that did not detect the woman crossing the road? So it's a very hard question. It, it is, let's say, the modern day trolley, uh, uh, trolley dilemma. Um, but, but even though there is no clear definitive answer, we need to think about these questions because I think what matters here is not just arriving at an answer, but it is our thought process and logic uh, of how we think about these problems and how we arrive at an answer. I've, I've, I won't say the country, but I've heard <laughs> some countries say like, if you're riding a vehicle and it's about to crash and you die, you just die. No, there's nothing, nothing else. It's just you your phone. And they just put it at that. And, uh, and that was quite uh, very black and white. And as I'm guessing from your laughs, so like it was a bit shocking to, to some. But, but yeah. that's the thing. Like we need more people to think about it, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very, uh, very, very interesting talk. Uh, very interesting questions and answers. Thank you very much, uh, Abu Ziyad. Uh, I wish we have more time to, to, to ask the other questions. But we took the first three uh, as we received them. So, Dr. Sam. Dr. Khaled, uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Yahya, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. I really uh, find it very interesting, very enlightening, and opening eyes in many things that we uh, take for granted. I have seen very interesting questions in the Q&A. And uh, Mr. Yahya, if you don't mind, I will send them to you. Maybe we can address some of them during the panel discussion. Uh, they are very interesting and uh, uh, part of uh, whatever we would like to achieve uh, in the panel discussion in terms of objectives. So I'll send them to you by email just to uh, have them in mind and maybe during your talk you address some of them. And I apologize for those who ask them. We will answer them during the panel discussion if you don't mind. So join us there and you will get, uh, inshallah, the answers. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Sami, Dr. Khalid, and, and everyone who organized this. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will hand over now the uh, mic to Dr. Othman Baroudi for our next speaker. Autonomous uh, vehicles. I'm a big fan of uh, Professor Kaku. Uh, most of you probably know him. He's a professor of theoretical physics at City College of New York. And in one of his video, he mentioned that uh, in the ne very near future, actually the car will become robot. So you can talk to them, uh, you can argue with them, you know, all of this thing. And uh, the car will know, uh, for example, in the case of accident about all the laws of the land and stuff. So it's, it's very futuristic and it's happening. And uh, uh, you know, being a uh, part of a millennial generation. So for those who don't know, millennial generation means the guys who born in between 1980 to uh, mid uh, 90s. So I see the changes in the technology and the adoption. And uh, for our, uh, you know, younger colleagues uh, who born after 2000, who are actually, I would say, a tech savvy generation. So they, they, they have a lot to see. And actually, they are going to be pioneer in, in so many fields. So with this, actually, let me kickstart uh, the discussion today. The agenda I'm going to cover in next 25 to 30 minutes is about, you know, uh, what are the solutions that Emerson is going to, uh, you know, support uh, in smart industry uh, and all uh, smart cities and industry, uh, industry itself, it could be uh, oil and gas, it could be petrochemical, it could be uh, water and others. And then what is Emerson digital uh, ecosystem, right? And how it is supporting uh, different aspects uh, of, of, the, of the challenges we are facing today. The main theme of my presentation is going to be about sustainability and decarbonization. And this is where I'm going to focus today. And uh, I'll, I'll look forward for a more interactive session. So I'll try to save some time, you know, at, uh, at least uh, five to 10 minutes so we can have a question and answer uh, going forward with this. So when we talk about smart, uh, you know, city, there are so many aspects, right? Let me put up my pointer. 
So it's not all the solutions. I mean, uh, uh, it's a courtesy uh, from Print Me poster. I took this picture here and uh, it, it's showing a lot of things, you know, what can be happened in a smart city. And when it comes to, uh, you know, Emerson, there are so many things that we can cover, you know, and support uh, the economy of of uh, of the city I, either it could be internet of things it could be environment it could be energy it could be waste management or leak detection courtesy of mckenzie institute they have uh, you know put uh, uh, like seven buckets of smart city solutions and uh, since my uh, topic today is going to be sustainability and decarbonization and here they can see that okay we have air quality monitoring energy use optimization and tracking of the energy streams and what we can get out of it right so we can uh, uh, load the uh, greenhouse gases by 10 to 15 percent and then of course there will be a, a good amount of solid waste reduction per person including water as well and how we can do that right this is a question i mean there are so many technologies uh, being used and actually implemented some of them are uh, i would say it's good and some of them need improvement and uh, i would like to quote uh, you know dr mazar he he very well mentioned that uh, at the end of the day uh, it's it's each individual uh, you know personal responsibility as well to make the livelihood you know in the neighborhood more attractive you know by 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 taking care of the waste by taking care of the energy using and stuff so that that was very compelling uh, statement i would say for me and digital transformation when we talk about it right it's about how we can automate or close the loop because there are so many manual practices going on and so many uh, silos of information when it comes to the uh, you know uh, uh, in a smart city perspective uh, you have irrigation you have electricity you have water supply uh, and and you have uh, you know uh, i would say road infrastructure you, i mean so on and so forth it's always there but what we have to see here is the first thing is how we can uh, you know uh, sense it i'll give you an example uh, uh, from my side uh, while i was a child that was back in 90s and early 2000 the uh, you know the electricity meter uh, wasn't digitalized so somebody every month need to visit and check the reading on the meter right and they then they they're gonna post you the bill uh, and, and that was a very common practice. But now, if you can see, everything is digitalized. Nobody is actually visiting uh, uh, your neighborhood to just to check down on how many units of electricity you have consumed this month because it is automatically being recorded at some central location in electricity office, right? And from there, they can also give you uh, some of the expertise opinion, right? That, for example, you are consuming more uh, than your peers in the same neighborhood. Either it is water consumption or electricity consumption. So uh, they, they give you an idea as how to do that. And on top of this, I mean, with the new technologies coming in, there is, uh, you would see a machine learning algorithms are being used, like, okay, for a similar kind of neighborhood, how much your water and electricity consumption or your, uh, you know, the waste disposal is there, how we can improve that. And then of course, by having, uh, you know, this kind of information, the action is more easy and, and, and more towards the point. And, and this is how we can repeat it. So that, that that's the whole, uh, idea of digital transformation that how we can identify the problem early and how we can address it in a shorter span of time so we can save uh, uh, you know not only time and effort but also we, we can be responsible for uh, more greener planet and more uh, uh, I, I, I would say uh, cleaner cities as well with this one I just wanted to give you a brief description of about our plant web digital ecosystem. So what it says is it's actually covering first the thing is data, right? And uh, uh, now we have such state of the art wireless uh, sensors, you know, it's cost effective. I mean, if you talk about uh, 70s, 80s or 90s, I would say 20 or 30 years ago to have a wireless sensor, it is going to cost you a fortune. 
you know with comparison to your normal uh, wide sensor but not is the uh, it's not the case now it is similar like when you go uh, uh, you know uh, and research something uh, the first mobile was launched somewhere in late 80s or early 90s and at that time to having a mobile phone you have to be a millionaire right and of course it's 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 not easy to buy but now everybody is holding a mobile phone because technology become cheaper and more accessible and similar happened in this pervasive sensing as well now we can sense the data directly from the source in real time and then we can connect it to uh, you know uh, any of your existing uh, infrastructure you have or we can take it to you uh, to the other iot platforms it could be anything you know it depends on the user uh, in in the field i mean what you wanted to monitor for example if i am a maintenance worker at, at an electricity company what i would like to be care about right how that what are the problems in the transmissions or what are the problems in the distribution so everybody is having different kpis so it depends it going to be in a different uh, visualization and then the platform should be uh, able to connect to any of the data sources or any of the uh, third party system so it's an agnostic it should be an agnostic platform because the world we are living in we just cannot rely on uh, you know one technology one company cannot save it all so it has to be a cohesive culture when it comes to uh, digital transformation as well we have to be connected to any existing or any futuristic uh, I, I would say information which will be available in the system to connect to and learn from it and then the uh, the more uh, upper pieces with the emerson uh, you know uh, scalability in terms of uh, helping the organization for changing management because just buying a technology is not going to save uh, you know to save the uh, what, what i would say to solve the problem we need to change ourselves and uh, this is where uh, I, I see most of the time the problem uh, uh, arise because we are so used to the way we work it's it's really hard to change so we can help uh, uh, the organization how to upskill the current workforce and uh, develop new change management procedures and of course when it comes to digital strategy and cyber security how we can make sure uh, you know in terms of uh, consulting that uh, the infrastructure is secured from any threats inside or from outside and then industrial expertise uh, so when it comes to industry emerson is a global one of the global leaders in automation you know when it comes to control systems and control uh, valves instrumentation or industrial applications so we can support and of course uh, the the last but not the least piece when it comes to cloud hosted solution because at the end of the day all of this data infrastructure is uh, in the smart city is going to be hosted uh, in, in 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 the cloud either micro soft azure either aws or google so that that just a, uh, a very quick brief about you know how emerson is uh, supporting the different aspects of the digitalization or digital transformation for our customer and our partners this platform is actually what we call it the machine learning and artificial intelligence platform it has the capability uh, as a system agnostic it can connect to any of your erp system or uh, you know uh, underlying information resources it could be your uh, enterprise data repository you know for contextualization of our unstructured data with the machine learning and artificial intelligence advanced pattern recognition models and then of course the uh, situational awareness tool when it comes to augmented reality or mobility to uh, to have the information you know distributed to the right people at the right time for informed decision making so let me give you a, a brief about the analytics uh, modules about it how it works so the first thing is actually going to be you know the learning from the historical data and when you said learning from the historical data we are talking about uh, machine learning algorithms and stuff just give me a moment sorry for the interference just give me a moment Sorry, 
uh, uh, sorry for the uh, uh, issue. So yeah, so first thing is we are going to learn from the uh, historical data to develop predictive models or advanced pattern recognitions, uh, you know, templates, and then uh, uh, gonna add on top of that, the domain expertise, because not everything, you know, is in the, uh, I would say in pen and paper, a lot of people actually I met in the industry, they always give me this that, okay, I'm working from, uh, you know, in this segment from last 10 to 15 years, and I have fully knowledge how things work around here, you know. So that thing need to be captured. And this is where this platform has the capability to retain uh, the experience of, of, a, uh, of a worker, not only for the current generation, but for the future generation as well, because at the end of the day, people will retire or move to another facility. So we have to retain their expertise. And then the root cause, right? What is the problem behind any deviation when it occurs with respect to predictive model? When I know there is an anomaly, right? Uh, what, what is wrong? What needed to be corrected? So that's another expertise where, uh, you know, we can, as, an, as a company, we can help our customers to identify. And then last but uh, most important as well, how to digitalize workflow? Because if we are still doing uh, you know, the manual work order, uh, I would say issuance, and then somebody walk up to the maintenance planner to get it fixed. It's still going to waste a lot of time. And uh, that has to be digitalized as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a single platform, which is covering all of these four functions, in, uh, you know, uh, for our customer, for the industry in, in, in one package. When it comes to architecture, right? It's it's a, like I mentioned earlier, it's a system agnostic. So it's an open architecture. It can connect to any of your uh, uh, existing data sources from third parties uh, or, or from, from your ERP applications. And then it has this intelligent layer, which is going to cover, you know, the different application use cases, either it is health and performance, energy and emission prediction, or uh, uh, specialized uh, use cases for industry and at the end process and asset digital twin and for the visualization again uh, a lot of uh, industry is using different visualization options it could be microsoft power uh, bi it could be sharepoint it could be tableau or wonderware so we are very flexible to connect any of your uh, existing visualization piece to give you the right kpis for informed decision making. So that just uh, to give you a quick background, you know, that what, what uh, platform we are talking about. And now I'll, I'll jump into the uh, use case of energy management information system here. So once we talk about energy management information system, right? So we have to look at uh, these four things, right? First is with, we need to measure, right? we need to measure what is it uh, we are uh, uh, you know producing or consuming in terms of energy and then we have to add the new advanced analytical tools because at most of the uh, facilities i talk about this system they are using uh, you know manual practices like uh, uh, excel sheet how much we consume last month how much we are uh, we should consume this month and it's it's a uh, I, I would say it's a big practice when you're doing it manually, it's not easy. So we need a new advanced analytical tool, of course, embedded with uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, uh, algorithm. And then uh, the new resource efficiency. Uh, I mean, that that is very important because uh, when I, uh, you know, uh, uh, listen to Dr. Mazar and also, you know, through the media, the commitment uh, of Saudi uh, I have a high respect for Saudi leadership, the way they are committing, and then every uh, aspect of the society, either it is government or academics or, or the industry, they are all having hands on deck, you know, to come up uh, with the new renewable source, either it could be solar, either it could be wind, and then the commitment to the world. I mean, Saudi commitment to the world is fantastic. And being the biggest, uh, you know, uh, hydrocarbon producer and they are committing 
uh, net zero by 2060 that that is awesome and this is show we uh, kingdom is not only helping the people in the kingdom but of course they are helping the world itself to make the planet more greener and uh, uh, and, and this this is where by addressing these four things there will be and there should be a step change in the sustainability performance that will be coming, uh, you know, and and uh, I'm 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 not uh, looking even 2060. We'll gonna see better result in next five to ten years, and I can bet on that. So energy met, uh, management methodology, right? How Emerson works. So first thing is, I, if I have developed a facility 20 years ago, correct, and I'm still using the same static target. Uh, which was designed by the feed contractors or by the OEMs of the, uh, you know, uh, of the assets. It's not true today because there, there is always a degradation happen uh, after 20 years of service. So what I need to be more realistic that how I perform in last one, two, three or four years and I have to come up with the dynamic targets, right? And this is where this data-driven analytics is going to help me to build a predictive model for energy consumption. And once I have this uh, model developed and uh, it is going to run, in, in the live uh, uh, application, which, which is 24 hours, 7, 365 days a year. And in case of any abnormal condition detection, it will automatically trigger, you know, the root cause analysis to identify what is going behind the scenes, why this, uh, uh, you know, the KPI is, 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 is being violated and what need to be done to get it fixed. So it's a whole closed loop system. And the last thing is, of course, the dashboard, right? What needed uh, uh, to, uh, to be done? And, and then, of course, we understand every person is having different KPIs and they would like to see the information as relevant to their job description. And this is where the informed decision making is going to help uh, to reduce the carbon footprint and of course the energy consumption. I have one uh, good case study actually out of kingdom as well. One of the, um, uh, you know, major oil producing facility, we started working with them six, seven years ago. And at that time, the objectives, uh, you know, we clearly defined, they wanted to reduce the energy costs, they were having, uh, uh, you know, wrong analysis coming out when it comes to static target, they didn't know where they have the opportunity to reduce energy consumption, and where they need to focus on you know, for better performance of their assets. And then a lot of uh, experienced operators were retiring and the, uh, and the gap, you know, the knowledge gap was pre, uh, pretty much uh, one of the biggest issue they were facing. So uh, once uh, we, we came to, uh, you know, uh, common ground, what needed to be fixed. So first thing is we identify the data sources, right, where we need to fetch data automatically, embedding it with the uh, root cause analysis and domain experts expertise from the experienced operators and then the right visualization to the right people for, for more enhanced decision making. And as a result, the people, uh, in, uh, you know, were having more visibility on the performance. They were having uh, more, uh, I would say, faster decision making. The problem uh, identification to problem resolution time was significantly reduced in this manner. The operation knowledge was retained and shared. And then if I, if I look at, you know, the success uh, they can able to monitor their full energy consumption, not only at the plant level, but at the asset level itself. And uh, the energy savings were more than 20 million US dollar. And this paper is actually presented by this customer in ARC exchange and in Emerson Global User Exchange in 2018 as well. So uh, that, that is one of the great, uh, uh, I, I would say, uh, site where they were able to achieve a lot of savings and it, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's one of the plants to look on and follow up uh, for the same uh, energy conservation scenario. The other thing I want to talk about is, you know, the predictive emission monitoring system. Uh, 
and 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 how emerson is 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 relevant there as an emerson i would like to stay greening off we are also looking inwards and uh, we have a commitment by 2028 to reduce the uh, you know greenhouse gas emission intensity by 25 20% across over 185 major site, uh, sites across the globe and it's not only us we are also working with our suppliers you know our partners uh, to to have a similar objectives you know to reduce the carbon emission for a better prosperous uh, future for us and uh, uh, i mean I'm, I'm i'm proud to say that as an emerson uh, saudi arabia we are supporting the uh, kingdom vision and uh, one of the recent thing uh, I, I would like to say with proud is that uh, we have uh, contributed with at, uh, as a start 5000 uh, you know trees in al hasa area and we'll keep on doing that and to make uh, uh, you know the commitment of the kingdom come true uh, even before 2030 when it comes to the greening and uh, when it comes to supporting our customers we are uh, you know giving solutions all the way at the optimization level of the different assets either it could be boilers compressors heat exchangers and uh, to through the instrumentation but at at, at the uh, you know the enterprise level platform for for the energy efficiency and optimization as well and then the third one is we are dealing with the academics uh, with the research houses to keep on developing innovative solution you know for more carbon capture and uh, having uh, products made by emerson who's going to support the uh, saudi as well as global initiative to reach uh, the commitment for the paris agreement as well when it comes to you know the technologies emerson is supporting uh, from a long time with our sem system you know for uh, uh, you know identifying the carbon emission this this is uh, something we've been doing for more than decades couple of decades and now with the advancement in the uh, you know the software platforms the predictive emission monitoring system which is a software based system now that, that is actually uh, i would say much cheaper compared to SAMS and it is also uh, uh, you know not on, uh, on on the capital cost but as a maintenance you know it is also uh, more reliable not for everything I mean still you need SAMS for example for your uh, uh, solid fuels right for incinerators but for the other applications you, uh, you can say that predictive emission monitoring system is going to help our industry a lot and uh, this is where we are going to learn from historic process and emission data create a neural network uh, predictive model run it and start predictive emission and uh, just to give you a holistic approach it's not only PAMS we are talking about we are talking about the full supply chain right all the way from field sensors covering uh, you know different assets in the industry you know either it is rotating or you're static and these are actually an uh, energy uh, consumers and producers and also responsible for the emissions as well so in the same uh, platform you can see how the emissions are working and if there is a violation in emissions or energy target which unit and which asset is responsible and why what is the root cause so that's how uh, you know the all this uh, uh, may Make sense starting to make sense and uh, you can address the areas where it need more uh, I would say attention in terms of maintenance in terms of operations and have a more uh, I would say green and uh, uh, you know in, in, in simple word I always say that we have to give this world in a better uh, situation than we receive it you know to the next generation and as an Emerson uh, we are very relevant to support, uh, you know, the industry uh, when it comes to uh, sustainability and decarbonization all the way from process generation, uh, you know, and then transmission, distribution and consumption. So we are committed that uh, we are going to look inward 
you know we're gonna green ourselves we have a commitment to make and then we're gonna support uh, the industry uh, uh, you know across the uh, uh, across the geography and then we are going to keep on developing new solutions and new products that will support the sustainability and decarbonization goals that was my last uh, slide uh, and uh, i'm open for questions and answers if any please Thank you very much, Mr. Rana, for the informative presentation. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have a few questions, if you allow me, Mr. Rana. Um, uh, the first question is that I would like to know, what, what do you mean by uh, sustainability in the context of uh, smart city? So sustainability, when I say it's about energy consumption, right? how we can reduce our energy consumption in terms of electricity, in terms of water, in terms of gas, and uh, how we can better utilize, uh, you know, these things and, um, uh, and, and, and make it a perfect example. So that, that's what I mean. Okay, great. Uh, also, I would like to know what, what's the uh, applicability of this uh, platform? Can we apply it everywhere? in any environment or there are required infrastructures and conditions so that it can be applied? No, this is a completely system agnostic platform. You, uh, you, can, you can have it anywhere you want and it has the capability to uh, you know, connect to your existing applications as well. So it's, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, I would say open platform who will going to learn from your existing and it's it's uh, it's going to leverage the existing infrastructure great, great. um just another uh, uh, question about uh, you know the the artificial intelligent uh, uh, techniques and the learning and the machine learning techniques that you mentioned uh, i'm just curious to know what what type of artificial intelligent techniques and machine learning techniques you are using so when it comes to that's a very good question, Emma. Thanks for asking. So uh, when it comes to machine learning, you know, developing a predictive model, it's uh, it depends on the application to application. For example, what we are trying to develop is energy, right? For example, I, I need to understand. Uh, 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 I'll take an example of boiler for for uh, everyone's sakes too. So it will be point uh, discussion that how much uh, steam is being uh, you know consumed uh, th 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 this this is one thing how the burner performance is so similar goes to uh, you know how we can make it better how we can further optimize it and this is where the machine learning algorithms could be different. There are so many algorithms by the way it could be principal component analysis, time series analysis, you know so uh, these uh, regressions you know models. And uh, normally, uh, as a rule of thumb, you know, uh, as a data scientist, if you uh, ask any of the data scientists, there is uh, uh, no single algorithm which can guarantee a perfect predictive model. They always have to test and try, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in, in simple words, uh, uh, if your R square or uh, your relative average relative error you know, is for example, close to zero and your R scare is more than 80%. It's a good predictive model, but there is always an improvement to uh, test and try others. Okay, okay, thank you. There are also a couple of questions by uh, Mr. Ahmed al Uh The first question is, what are the barriers that usually block the path to transformation? Sorry, can you repeat it? Sorry for that. Uh, what are the barriers that usually block the path to transformation? What are the barriers to black? So again, a very good question. So the block, I, I would say is, uh, you know, it's not something that uh, uh, is uh, technologically blocked. No, it's not about this. It's, it's more about, you know, the way we work. Uh, and and uh, the change management, I would say it's it's uh, and and the people you know they are so much used to do things in their own way. So, I I, I will I will not put a blame on technology. Sorry to being vocal, but it's about how we work. We need to change our habits. Uh, 
and and this is how the uh, the blockage will be removed so uh, for instance if i made a commitment you know that uh, uh, we are going to reduce the carbon intensity uh, for, ex for example in my home right i am responsible i need to look at what are the carbon i need to switch off the lights so it's it's not the technology it it is going to be uh, the way we work so that's how i see it all right um, another question, if you allow me, by Mr. Ahmed also. How do we measure if your digital transformation was successful? And if not, how, do, how, how to adjust? Very good question. I really appreciate for asking. So for any project, right, the first thing, if I'm an end user, I need to understand is what I'm trying to improve here, right? Where I am today. What is my objective? It, it, when I say the objective, it's, it's in, in uh, industry term, it's return on investment. It could be two or threefold. One thing is how much money I'm going to save, what uh, uh, is I'm going to improve in terms of, uh, you know, carbon emission capture or uh, utilization of my facility in better word. So these things has to be identified from the start. It's not that we have to implement it and see. No, it has to be identified first. And then we need to uh, see what technology is required to achieve that goal. So that's how I see it, uh, to, to make it a successful project. And I always uh, uh, a big advocate that uh, rather than think about big, let's start on a small scale, right? Get it proved and then, uh, you know, scale it fast. So sky's the limit then. Yes. Um, another audience is asking, is there a specific algorithm Immersion uses for uh, automatic root cause analysis? So automatic root cause analysis is, is not an algorithm. Let me put it, you know, in, in that way, because this is this is uh, uh, something I like to explain. So automatic root cause analysis is uh, in, in industry. We know it as FMEA or failure mode effect analysis. You know, the, for example, how a pump fail. There are different reasons. Correct, and and uh, we we list these reasons in normally in an Excel sheet, how how a compressor fail or or how uh, you know different things failure mode. So what we do is we convert this Excel into RCAs, which is now digital, looking in real time. Uh, you know, once a deviation detected through predictive model, it it start looking inward. Okay, what is wrong? Uh, and I. Is this answer the question, Ahmed? Sorry, uh, yes. I don't want to be too much technical. Yes, you are. That is good. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Rana, for the informative uh, presentations. Dr. Oh, Ahmed, uh, if you mind, uh, there are two questions, very interesting, and we still have two minutes. If you can address them from the chat. Uh, uh, let me start with this. For the 20 million saving example, the digitalization effect is having more effect in finding where the issue is or is it the type of controlling system developed specifically, specifically for that case? That's a wonderful question. I'll, I know the time is short, but I'll be very uh, precise. So what yeah, we Yeah, you have is, another uh, one, so you will be precise. <laughs> yeah, so what we utilize is uh, non-linear programming and mixed integer non-linear programming uh, optimization techniques. Okay, what it do is it looks at uh, what is our production demand, and what are the asset available, okay? And out of these assets, which are the best assets to uh, operate, you know, and, and, and this mixture is actually where they were saving. Before this platform, uh, it was completely uh, operated to see, and you know, to, for example, there are two compressors, A and B, which one to on off in, in different demands. So they were not having uh, visibility, which one is performing better, and uh, which one uh, is going to help them uh, to meet their demand, for example, 10 minutes early or five minutes uh, later. So these things uh, uh, is, is actually optimization uh, is helping them to save money in terms of opportunity loss. I can have, I mean, uh, you can contact me separately whenever you want to have more information about this. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, sorry if I'm not able to answer it perfectly, but it's a very short time. No, no. Uh, the other one, I somehow lost it. I don't know where it, it went. Uh, yeah, I can't see it yeah, either. Yeah, I can see it here. 
Anyhow, the, 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 I think we are uh, on time right now. So uh, thank you very much. This is really excellent. Uh, I think there is a lot of uh, work to be done in making all these systems that you showed um, uh, talking to other systems from uh, that are available in the market. This is very important to have kind of seamless, um, uh, what we call it, uh, kind of plug and play of all these devices on the systems and they should be recognized uh, uh, without any dependency to the technology. But this is maybe something that is, uh, can be migrated from the industrial process type of technology. Yeah? Thank you, Sami. Thank you, Ahmed, and everyone for having me today. It was my pleasure and uh, uh, wish thank everybody uh, on the audience uh, thanks again for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is Dr. Rashid here? I think Dr. Rashid is not here. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Steve, uh, Stephen uh, Pagliari from uh, Aramco. Is Steve uh, Stephen around? I think he is here, right? Yes. <laughs> well, How are you? Good, uh, thank you. So, yeah, let me take this uh, chance to present you uh, on behalf of Dr. Rashid Mansour. Uh, so, Dr. Stephen he joined the Carbon Management Division at Aramco in 2018, where he works on membrane materials and processes for making hydrogen. He received a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering in 93 uh, from Oregon. Uh, State University, uh, and then he worked on membrane re reactor and catalyst uh, development at the uh, Battelle Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, uh, Washington. Uh, Stephen also went on to receive a PhD degree in chemical engineering and petroleum refining with a minor in material science from the Colorado School of Mines in 99. And he did the postdoctoral research at Los Almas National Laboratory in New Mexico from, 2000, uh, from uh, 1999 to 2009, where he developed the new materials for hydrogen purification and storage. So before joining Aramco, he worked at TDA Research uh, near Denver uh, from 2009 to 2018, where he contributed to projects on metallic membrane for hydrogen separation, protective coating, and scaling up the production of metal organic framework absorbents. Uh, he co-authored co more than 30 peer-reviewed publications, including book chapters and the review article on palladium membranes. He also uh, holds several US uh, patents on membranes. And today he will be talking to us about hydrogen production for power and uh, transportation. Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Sammy, for the kind introduction. I'd also like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present today. I think it's timely with the announcement by the Kingdom um, with their 2060 goal. Um, I also wanted to add that Ramco has made a similar commitment to reduce their, their emissions to net zero by 2050. So this is a good time to, um, to host, to have this, uh, these discussions. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Just, uh, let me know if you can see that. Yes, it's perfect. Excellent. So, uh, there we go. So um, yeah, the topic is hydrogen production for power and transportation. I'll, I'll describe some ongoing projects that we have in Saudi Aramco and in some, you know, looking at a higher level, but also getting down into some more of the details of, of the science and things behind that and some collaborations we have with your university. So just to summarize, I'll talk about the background, why hydrogen, what is the demand for hydrogen, the uh, technology that we're talking about today and specifically is membranes and membrane reactors for hydrogen separation and production talk a little bit about how to fabricate these membranes and scaling them up. Um, some details about the process we're going through to scale up these, these technologies to actually implement them and try to use them in the future. Uh, and then the next steps. So just let's just start with the basics. Where will this hydrogen be used? Well, 
you can burn hydrogen in an internal combustion engine or in a turbine or in um, you know a, a hot box a furnace to make electricity but those those types of um, technologies are limited by, by by engineering cycles their efficiency is maybe 50 percent at best because your bulk of your energy is going into heat a fuel cell actually reacts electrochemically uh, in, in some cases, like for the proton exchange membrane or PAM fuel cell, it takes place at low temperature. And so you're, you're harvesting most of the energy from the hydrogen. You're turning it directly into electricity instead of heat. Um, you can see here that these are some of the different types of fuel cells. In all cases, you feed in your fuel, you have um, the, the excess gas comes out. The, typically you feed it in humid air um, and then basically the you have some kind of membrane that the, um, as shown here on the right, the uh, hydrogen goes in, diffuses through as a proton, reacts with oxygen on the other side, and creates water. So really the only um, emission from this is, is water. So that opens up the opportunity for hydrogen to be a carbon-free energy carrier. So, so one of the things driving this is um, of course, transportation, it takes, it is a large fraction of the emissions globally. Um, as you all know, electric vehicles are increasing the market share. I noticed that today Tesla is over a trillion dollar company now. And I think for these smaller vehicles and passenger vehicles, electricity, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you can use, you know, electricity is everywhere. It's easy to connect to the grid and recharge your vehicle. Although some of the disadvantages are that it takes time to do that. And um, also for larger vehicles, the batteries become um, heavier as shown in this plot. So things like trucks and um, larger commercial vehicles, the weight penalty starts to become greater. And then also as you go further away, that the, they do have limited range before you have to recharge. And so that is another disadvantage. Um, someone spoke earlier about the challenges also with aircraft um, that's coming, but um, you know that's uh, under development at this time. So the, what this plot shows is the evolution of the demand for hydrogen that's been predicted in the near future, uh, or at least up to 2050. You may have heard of gray hydrogen, and what that refers to is hydrogen that you make with a conventional way, where you just let the CO2 go into the atmosphere. So in the near, in maybe up through 2030, that's going to be the primary way that we make hydrogen. That, that'll be taken over by blue hydrogen. What that refers to is you know, hydrogen that you make where you capture and do something with the CO2. You either reuse it or you store it away, you sequester it. And then as time goes on, we'll use green hydrogen. And that means that you make it from a renewable source a renewable solar or wind power, hydropower that connects to, you know, you supply electricity through those methods. And so your, your electricity has no carbon footprint or essentially no carbon footprint. And the reason that blue hydrogen is important as a, as a bridge during this energy transition um, is because the costs and the um, transition to green energy is happening over a, a, the time frame of decades. It doesn't just happen overnight. So as we install all this infrastructure and develop these technologies and the costs come down through economies of scale, producing the electrolyzers that split the water into hydrogen and oxygen for the green hydrogen. We'll use blue hydrogen um, as a transition over to that for the future. So this plot here, or these, uh, these diagrams show that the bulk of hydrogen now currently comes the, the 70 million tons per year that's produced um, around the globe. It comes from mostly from natural gas, with some coming from oil, some from coal, and actually less than 5% comes from electricity or electrolysis of water. And that's because of what I mentioned earlier is, is the cost of electricity is still higher than using these other sources. And, and as those, but as those technologies um, mature, electricity will gain more and more market share. And where does that hydrogen go? Right now, about 10% goes into methanol. Um, other is other chemicals. It's a lot of it's used in refining. Um, that's where a lot of this hydrogen made from oil comes from. It's used directly in the refinery 
to process other feeds to make them more, um, econ you know, more um, uh, economical. And then a, a lot of it actually goes into ammonia for fertilizers. As you can see here, by 2030, uh, sorry, this is cut off, but the transportation is shown in blue here. So a bulk of the hydrogen now is used in the refining industry, as shown by this gray fraction of the bar. Only a small fraction is used in transport, under 0.6 millions of barrels per day equivalent hydrogen. And that's expected to grow um, to um, 8 million barrels of, day, of oil equivalent per day by 2050 in transport. So a lot of the growth, bulk of the growth is coming from transport, but also with some other applications for hydrogen in power as well as building. As, as I said, hydrogen will become a key a carrier for energy that's, that's free of carbon. Um, I should also note that it's also predicted by 2050 that 80% of the hydrogen will still come from hydrocarbons even then, as the green hydrogen um, will take a, will ha have a, enjoy a 20% market share by that time. So that's why it's important that we work now to develop these technologies so that we have time to show them and for them to grow and, and take over. What this plot shows is uh, basically the uh, different types of energy carriers. So hydrogen itself is expensive to compress and transport because it's a gas, it's low density, and you can transport it as a liquid but that's also challenging. There's not really any ships that exist for the large scale transport of liquid hydrogen. So what we have to do is use a chemical carrier, um, or one of them is methyl cyclohexane uh, or ammonia, where you convert it back to hydrogen at the, at the um, port. And of course, also comparing this to liquid hydrogen as sort of a baseline, and then um, using the uh, in, in market production of hydrogen. So what this really is showing is this green bar is the last mile. That means taking whatever you have, converting it into hydrogen, and shit, transporting that to a fueling station, that can actually come up to about a third of the hydrogen cost because it's expensive to transport hydrogen. So that opens up an opportunity to make hydrogen at the fueling station and eliminate this extra cost. So basically the strategy here is to leverage the existing global supply network of fuels, of liquid fuels, that can be transformed into hydrogen. That already exists. It's trillions of dollars of infrastructure, and Aramco itself has up to access to over 10,000 stations, fueling stations. And like I mentioned, we need to continue to innovate and, and make these new technologies available um, through continuous work on uh, research and development, as well as piloting and demonstrations. And, implement, and ultimately commercial implementation. And this will position oil and other hydrocarbon feedstocks to be a leading source of carbon-free hydrogen, assuming we're using blue hydrogen where the CO2 is captured and stored. So what here is shown is the primary way that meth uh, methane is converted into hydrogen is through steam methane reforming. So you react methane with steam at very high temperatures, uh, up to 900 degrees and 40 bar. And this is just shown for scale. These are very large reactors that have 10 meter long catalyst filled tubes inside a very large burner. So in this case, you're using about a third of your feedstock, in this case, natural gas. You're burning that just to make the heat necessary to reach these high reaction temperatures. And so that's inherently inefficient and it's difficult to capture the CO2 from flue gas because it has a low CO2 concentration. So well, here are the steps. You purify your feed, remove any sulfur and other compounds that might affect the process and, ruin, and, and damage your catalysts. You carry out the steam reforming reaction. And then you also have a CO uh, issue that there's residual carbon monoxide. So that has to be converted in additional reactors. And then you have to purify the hydrogen. And so what we're proposing is you replace this with a single step. And that's a membrane reactor where you feed your hydrocarbon in steam. It, the hydrogen permeates through the react through the membrane, and it leaves a CO2 rich stream. And what this does is by extracting the hydrogen through the Chatelier's principle, you're shifting the equilibrium of that reaction towards the products. And so you can actually run this at much lower temperatures and uh, similar pressures to, to keep the driving force through the membrane high. 
but that enables you to have a much more compact reactor, maybe up to 100 times smaller for uh, output than this um, full, than the uh, traditional method. You can efficiently capture the CO2 and get high conversion at the same time. So basically, well, this is just summarizing the blue uh, the blue boxes here signify off-the-shelf technologies, so we're not really interested in working on those as further research. The green ones, these are where we're focusing our research efforts. And then the purple ones, they're um, it's kind of off-the-shelf, but there is room for potential improvement to uh, make the whole system more efficient. So basically, as an overview of this project, the uh, so we're taking these membranes and scaling them up from small to larger ones for the, for the uh, commercial size. So it goes from technology readiness level four to five in this. We're currently at stage three out of five gates, out of five stages. They're, um, basically we're doing a design to optimize it for 100 normal cubic meter of hydrogen per hour capacity. We're designing a reformer and it's integrated with uh, both heat for heat and uh, efficiency integrated. We're fabricating the membrane reformer itself into a started with a single tube and go into a multi-tube reactor for more compactness and efficiency. And currently we're in the piloting stage. So we're going from a small um, lab scale unit to a more, um, a larger lab scale unit that produces about 20 kilograms of hydrogen per day. So how does the te technology work? Well, it basically relies on a solid state diffusion of hydrogen through a thin film, which is a, composed of a palladium alloy. So the thinner the film, the higher the flux of hydrogen through that. The hydrogen diffuses to the surface, it dissociates into atoms and diffuses through the solid metal as protons. Then it reassociates and diffuses away as hydrogen on the other side. It leaves all the other gases trapped so that you have high selectivity and in theory can have very high purity hydrogen. It's shown here, there's a, this is shown a, a micrograph showing the porous support and a thin palladium film supported on the surface. And this is what this tube looks like uh, in practice. Uh, it uses graphite fittings inside these standard compression fittings to um, seal the membrane and to connect it. Because it's on a porous ceramic, you have different coefficients of thermal expansion, so you have to connect that to a stainless steel manifold using this, these techniques. And this, this brings up uh, one of the first projects we worked with with KFUPM in collaboration with Professor Zain Yamani's group. Uh, they uh, worked on ways to scale up the membrane manufacturing and looked at making different alloy materials uh, using these um, equipment here in their laboratory. You start with the bare porous ceramic tube, which is made of aluminum oxide. You activate that, and then you basically coat that with a very thin film of palladium which is the material that the hydrogen diffuses through the fastest. So they've created a way to test these membranes in their laboratory uh, with an automated testing apparatus. And so once the membranes are manufactured, we leak check them. Um, in this case, there was a small pinhole, but um, generally we um, are working on ways to uh, improve the fabrication process to eliminate any defects and to optimize the alloy composition as well. So this is just a micrograph showing the bare alumina surface. You can see that it's porous. It's about, this is about a five micron scale bar. You can see this is the uh, electroless plated palladium film, and this is a close-up of a grain boundary. So by focusing on the material science, we can use what we've learned to improve the manufacturing process. This is just showing some data uh, of the methane conversion versus time. You can see that it was stable with methane conversions of over 85, about 80 to 85 percent um, over a period of almost a thousand hours. So this was uh, taken at 550 degrees and high pressure and a steam to carbon, steam to methane ratio of three. What this is showing is similar data which showing conversion versus pressure. So you can see that there's an optimal pressure. Um, the reaction itself is not favored by a higher pressure because it creates more moles of gas than it starts with. But when you're operating in the membrane reactor, the higher pressure promotes the permeation of the hydrogen through the membrane, which also promotes the reaction. 
And so there's a trade-off between um, the pressure and the uh, conversion. Uh, Steve, you have 10 minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, here in this case, you can also see the effect of temperature. The, um, basically, the uh, temperature is, is, the reaction is highly endothermic, the, the steam reforming a methane, and so it's favored at higher temperature as well. So we're really trying to develop materials that can function better at higher temperatures and withstand these conditions um, for long periods of time. Um, this brings up the other work that we're doing in a collaborative project with uh, KFUPM, uh, with Professor uh, Mansour, Makaimer, and Habib's teams. The, they're working on CFD modeling to look at what's happening inside this membrane reactor, uh, looking at the temperature and uh, thermal gradients, as well as the concentration gradients. And using this, we're using this data to make um, improvements in the design of the membrane reactor. Some of the other work that goes hand in hand with that is developing better materials of the membrane itself. And in this case, uh, they use first principle based modeling to predict the properties of different palladium alloys, which we can use to optimize the alloy composition. So this is just showing um, after testing, you can see there's a change in the microstructure. And you can see this cross section is showing the, the thin film of palladium on the porous support. And we also used EDAX analysis to determine that this membrane had a composition of 1.8 weight percent of gold. And that, that makes it more um, robust than just the pure palladium. So as we scale up, we're working uh, collaborating with TNO, which is the energy laboratory of the Netherlands. Basically, we, we can, um, they're using larger tubes and creating these in a, um, a more scaled up um, fabrication facility. This shows down here the, the um, different uh, results that they got, the different gold ratios and the different layer thicknesses of the, all these membranes that they made. And these membranes are about a meter long and they'll be incorporated into a, a pilot unit. Uh, this just shows some of the challenges. The graphite seals, um, they uh, potentially can leak if they're not sealed properly. So that's a challenge that we had to overcome. As well as these tubes, they can have some surface irregularities. And also there's some issues with them being, they need to be very straight so that they can fit into the module. So we're working with the supplier to improve the quality of these supports so that they are um, work better for this application. Um, the catalyst is important, a critical part of this as well. We worked with KFUPM again to develop different catalysts uh, and also with KAIST in Korea, the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. We're working with them to have a pre-reforming catalyst that, so it can feed different liquid fuels and then create a methane-rich stream. We also, in the membrane reactor, it's different. It operates at 300 degrees lower than the conventional steam methane reforming. So it would be expected that you would need a different catalyst to be optimized to get the best results from that, from that environment. So this is just a basic um, schematic of the showing how the module works. It's a tube in tube uh, scheme where the membrane is inside a, a tube and you feed the gases and they permeate through the, hydro the hydrogen separating membrane and are recovered in the high high concentration hydrogen stream and then a high concentration CO2 stream at the outlet. And the, the, the advantages of having a modular approach is this can be a key to um, decreasing the cost and increasing the productivity of scale up. Uh, it also enables you to add modules to the fueling station as they're needed to meet the demand rather than investing in a large unit that has a high capital cost, you can optimize your capital usage. So this is just some schemes showing how the panel is integrated um, into the larger units. Um, right now we're in this middle stage and if it's successful, we'll go, we'll go to this 200 kilogram per day design. Just showing some details of how this pilot unit's put together. The heating plates are directly in contact with the tubes for more efficient heating. 
you can see here the, the, the membranes are being um, put into these tubes, these pressure vessel tubes. They have to be put in there and sealed. And this is the module um, uh, upright and then sealed and then uh, um, placed, plumbed into the unit and insulated. And so this is currently being tested at Lindy. And we look forward to the results soon, which hopefully I can share with you next time. Um, the next generation, we're always looking for what's next. The membrane material that we're using now is expensive. It's palladium. Uh, we minimize the cost by using a very thin, thin layer. But it, there's other materials out there that may be more promising and, and may potentially replace it. And in this case, it's a barium, zirconium, cerium, yttrium material, proton conducting ceramic. It also operates at high temperature. But as you can see here, the concept here, it's similar to the, the palladium membrane where the hydrogen diffuses through the proton conducting ceramic, which is shown here embedded in a nickel matrix. So it's a very thin layer, about 30 microns. Um, the, the driving force here is not only pressure, but current, electrical current. So you apply a voltage across this, and you can actually drive the hydrogen through it at a very high rate. Uh, it generates heat, but that couples directly to the endothermic reforming reaction, so it's very efficient. And also, it, it, it's a way to electrify your reactor, so you can take advantage of any green electricity that you have, you know, from solar or wind. So you can eliminate the source of carbon used to generate the electricity to run the process, or you can avoid burning um, fuels to generate the heat necessary. And so that's an, a potential advantage of this new concept with this electrochemical membrane. Um, and it can also compress the hydrogen as well. So you can get up to 150 bar, and that saves you downstream where you have to compress the hydrogen for storage at the fueling station to pressures of up to 950 bar for, for dispensation into the hydrogen vehicles. So that, that helps a lot with the downstream compression costs as well. And again, like the other membrane reactor, it creates a CO2 rich stream that makes it easy to capture and reuse this carbon dioxide. Uh, Stephen, there are two couple of questions and uh, you still have uh, only three minutes before the next speaker. Do we'd like you to wrap up the presentation and answer the questions? Definitely. So let me just skip this and uh, go directly to the summary. This is the concept where we take our existing fueling station in the Durant Techno Valley, the first hydrogen station in, in the kingdom. And eventually in the future, we'd like to have on-site hydrogen production from naphtha and different hydrocarbon feedstocks with, with CO2 capture to, uh, so that we can successfully supply blue hydrogen for your fuel cell vehicles. And these are just the vehicles that we're currently using and testing, the hydrogen vehicles including a forklift and a gen set replacement. And I just want to thank my collaborators and without their assistance, this never, this project wouldn't have happened. And thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Hydrogen is one of the uh, energy that we are targeting in uh, smart mobility. Uh, and I have two questions, one of mine, but uh, we will see if the time will allow for that. The first question is from Hussein. He said, I, uh, I, just, I was just asking if the hydrogen produced from Japan, uh, does it have different characteristics compared to the local KSA product? Um, the hydrogen has to meet strict specifications for use in the fuel cell vehicle. So wherever it's produced, it has to be purified um, to 99.999% pure, so that way it doesn't affect the long-term performance of the fuel cell vehicle. So yeah, it should be the same quality. All right, excellent. The second question says, what's the name of the principle that is considered for removing CO2 uh, carbon dioxide from NT? Can you respond in text? My class just started. So maybe you can uh, <laughs> give us the answer. Then after that, you can send us this answer to uh, Fawaz. I, did, I didn't quite catch the question. What was the... He said, what's the principle that is considered for removing carbon dioxide from NT? Um, the principle, um, I'm not really sure I'm getting it. All right. Uh, so maybe we yeah, can look I, at it later. Oh, 
carbon capture utilization and storage is maybe what he's looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, is there any other potential technology other than regular reactors to produce hydrogen? Such as, for example, using electrical methods. I think you talked about renewable energy, right? Renewable energy. Yeah, there are ways you can actually directly decompose natural gas into carbon and hydrogen. Um, that's uh, basically one way you can do it. Um, yeah, and electrolysis is another that I mentioned. Um, those are the primary ways you can use um, microbes. You can use, uh, you know, microbiology. There's biological ways that you can you can make hydrogen. Um, some of these ways are being investigated. You know, from algae potentially, you know, gasification of fuels. So there's several different ways, but the primary way is the steam methane reforming. Thank you very much, Dr. Steve, for this excellent presentation. We really appreciate uh, uh, your attendance to this forum and your uh, participation and uh, presentation as all the other speakers that we have uh, in this forum. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. And I should add that the the opinions I expressed today are not necessarily those of my employer, but are my own. But and thank you again for the opportunity. <laughs> thank you. Uh, all right, I hand the floor to Dr. Khaled for the next speaker. Dr. Khaled. Thank you, Dr. Sami. Thank you, Dr. Steve. Uh, now the next presentation will be about the permanence of consumer acceptance of autonomous vehicles. It's a case study in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, this presentation will be given by Dr. Brahim Asagihan. Dr. Brahim is an assistant professor at uh, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, at KFEPM. He received his bachelor and master degrees from KFEPM and his PhD degree from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, his research interests include traffic safety, traffic operation, human factors, auto automated vehicles, and machine learning. Uh, Dr. Brahim, the floor is yours. Ibrahim, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Just give me a second. Um, I think I'm facing some difficulty issue. Just give me a second. Do you face technical problems, uh, Dr. Ibrahim? Uh, I think I have solved it. Just give me a second. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, do you see the presentation? Yes, but it's uh, a little bit small. We cannot read very well. Okay. Just give me a second. Uh, Dr. Brahim, if you want, you can send it to me. I can share it from my side here. No, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, I um, think it will be great right now. Okay. Um, 
Uh, very good. Yeah, yeah it's uh, clear now, Eric, but you can start, uh, please. Perfect, perfect, great. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Thank you um, all uh, for bearing with me um, today. And I'm going to talk about uh, tearing of consumer acceptance of autonomous vehicle and a case of Saudi Arabia. And likely, Dr. Khaled, uh, we have worked together on this project. And yeah, um, so one, one of the... Um, one of the problems that we face every day is uh, traffic crashes and uh, like fatality and injury. For, uh, injury. for example, like uh, if in US or America, we have <clears throat> we have about 2.2 million in, uh, injuries due to road crashes, and that result in uh, about 30,000 fatalities. <clears throat> that it, it was uh, estimated that the cost of about 300 billion, uh, 300 billion US dollars. And however, 90% 90, 90 of these crashes due to human errors or bad drivings. Autonomous vehicles have given the promise to, uh, to deal with this issue and uh, handling all the driving maneuvers um, from being handled by humans to be handled by uh, softwares and, uh, um, and automated vehicles. So um, that could help to reduce 90% of the car crashes um, <clears throat> uh, in the world. However, um, one of the most significant barrier to uh, AV acceptance is not the technical uh, aspects. It, it is the acceptance of the drivers. So um, I think one of the comments that I have seen uh, earlier in, in, uh, in, in Dr. Uh, Hawaii presentation was um, that if we have a mix of, of, uh, of vehicles, like mix of conversion and automated vehicles. How the drivers gonna, gonna interact with these vehicles? How the drivers gonna uh, work within these uh, automated vehicles? So the benefit cannot be realized uh, if the public does not accept automated vehicles. So the use of AVs is directly proportionally related to the degree of trust exposed to toward it. Actually, it is like vaccine, so if, 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 if if we have a good example that we live right now. So if we don't have enough people who vaccinated, um, we cannot get rid of this um, uh, this uh, COVID uh, situation. So understanding driver acceptance uh, acceptance is, is is essential for identifying the limitation and the possibility associated of these systems, and also predict user intention and interest. However. There is a lack of a precise definition of acceptance of a new technology and measurement of these acceptance. So um, the concept of acceptance can be classified into five categories. So the using forward accept and uh, the acceptance as satisfy the needs of requirement and also the sum of attitude, when it's used and when it's pay and also uh, the action use. However, the author also have considered other categories like tech savvies and uh, where are you um, uh, a person who is, who is um, a tech savvy and like to follow the technology. What's your opinion or environmental view about, um, for example, we had a lot of presentations talking about zero carbon and the safety of AV and the trust of if AV. So we have made a survey was designed and uh, just demonstrated through Sur uh, uh, Survey Monkey to the resident of Riyadh and it was published in Arabic and English and have uh, it has started with providing what's the survey aim and uh, what is AVs and a YouTube video in Arabic and English uh, have presented to it. And we have also asked about their age and whether they have uh, a valid driver license. So if, uh, if the survey takers is under 18, I mean, he doesn't have a valid driver license. So um, we will not uh, allow that. Um, also, um, the number of years spent being licensed drivers, gender, level of education, and a primary language, and hours spent driving each week. Also, um, we had about like 28 questions, I think, 28, yeah, 24 questions, and uh, we, we have divided them in different topics. So the first topic was, a conversion, and uh, we have brought different questions from different um, uh, 
different literature, yeah, a paper and literature, literature for you. For example, like in Cambridge, in Cambridge, and how would you feel about driving alongside the autonomous? Um, some people might be trying to uh, staying away from driver uh, AVs, and some of them might drive closer. And do you think that autonomous? Uh, the second question was, do you think like autonomous vehicle will will uh, be easier than manual driving? So and. Um, the third question, I believe that in 30 years from now, automated driving will also be advanced. So, so it is be uh, irresponsible to drive manually. And um, the, the second topic was environmental concern. Like I'm willing to spend uh, a bit more to buy a product that is more uh, uh, environmentally friendly. And, and for example, like, um, and also I really worry about the effects of pollution in myself and my family. Um, we had some question about the tech, uh, tech uh, savvy. It's like I often push, um, or buy like a new technology product, even though they are expensive. And this, the, the second question, like science and technology are making our life healthier, easier, and more convertibles. And we had another topic about trust. Like uh, we asked, like, do you, like I trust human, uh, I trust, uh, I trust uh, autonomous vehicles, and I would like to make my family to use them. So we add another perspective, like if your family, you will allow your family to use it. And also, do you think like autonomous vehicle will decrease my accident risk and um, and I then I would switch uh, the third question. Like I would switch from uh, to manual driving to automated driving in case of uh, bull weathers. And uh, then uh, the fifth topic was about willing to use. Like how would you raise your over uh, overall level of trust in the Silicon Valley tech uh, companies, uh, cars? How would you rate your overall level of trust in traditional cars? And uh, thermos vehicle also will let you uh, let me uh, do other tasks such as eating, watching a movie, or call uh, or be on cell phone on my trip, and other questions. How and in, in this survey we have collected about five hundred um, uh, five hundred spawns, and actually we have we had a good good. Um, Distribution and the age, like as we know, most of um, age distribution in Saudi Arabia, are, we have a young uh, population, and that's as we can see here and 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 um, in these categories. And as a genders, we had like only 50, 50 females, and uh, sorry, um, uh, we had only like fifty females and four hundred fifty. Uh, males and it was expected. We had uh, we did this research like two years ago, and um, um, and most of, of 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 the drivers were male, not the females. And uh, we had a good distribution of of uh, liver indications uh, from uh, from people who have, have only like diploma, graduated from high school, graduated from college, master, had a master's degree and university degrees. We had the distribution. Um, actually, like most of, of our uh, exam taker were uh, were uh, their mother language was Arabic, and and um, the, our driving weekly is what uh, like for less than five hours. We had one twenty four, and between six and ten, we had one sixty eight, and. Um, the question was measured on a scale from like one, like strongly disagree to five, uh, strongly disagree. However, except some some questions, we uh, like first question like it's from from like extremely uncomfortable to five uh, to five and extremely comfortable. And um, then after that, we after we scale these uh, these questions. Um, uh, we made some analysis uh, on these questions, for example, and we found like mostly people tend to to to, to trust and uh, have a good distribution uh, to, to to trust uh, autonomous vehicles. And um, for example, here um, most of the people think that uh, like uh, we had like an, an amino of three point seven like. Uh, uh, possibly they think like autonomous will make their life easier. And they think like um, uh, it will be, um, the system will be so advanced so it can drive 
uh, by itself. However, um, I'm really, for example, like uh, we had, I'm really worried about the effect of pollution myself and, um, uh, and my family, we had like two, 2.9, and that could be a concern too. Uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about the current environment of pollution, so the rate Dr. Brahim? I'm, I'm sorry, I seem that I got disconnected. I didn't know. No problem. Okay, so, um, and uh, this is the analysis that, uh, like a graphical analysis of, of these different questions. However, um, one of the questions that we have asked, we have asked to um, the, the, exam, uh, the survey takers to, to um, To categorize or or um, break their trust in different car manufacturers or uh, autom uh, automakers, and we have big different um, <clears throat> car manufacturers from uh, different country like Chinese companies, Korean, US, and some European um, and UK companies, and also like um, um, it's the Silicon Valley companies, for example, and. We had the lowest was uh, the China, a Chinese company Shenzhen, and the the rate the trust the mean of trust was only like thirty nine point one. However, uh, in Mercedes today their trust was about eighty one percent. In conversion, like Google and um, and Toyota, the Google had sixty eight and Toyota has like sixty six point two three. So. Um, and, and, and the mean of trust in, in Toyota was higher than Tesla and Jack one and, or even Apple's and Ford. So, um, and this is a show also like a graph, graphical representation as you can see, like Mercedes has the highest one and um, the Hennessy's high one and Shenzhen has the lowest one in the Chinese. But however, um, this is not, um, I will talk about this one result, and this is could change with the time as as these uh, car manufacturer um, improve with the time. So um, uh, then we we have uh, made some I don't know what is to check whether these there is a significant difference in ranking uh, of 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 uh, of the factor related to uh, AV acceptance, and uh, it shows there is a significant uh, significant difference between them. And we found that, um, and uh, found that the, the the least mean was the trust. So we has uh, the lowest category was the trust. However, willing to to use was had the highest mean uh, among the survey takers. And um, we found that uh, uh, we found that, and so. We found that um, we made that also like a B, B value of uh, t testing uh, on on these uh, factors and among genders and um, uh, like female and male and we found that um, uh, there is no difference uh, in, in 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 tech savvy. So male and female uh, have the same uh, ambition for our same um, mean of uh, tick service. However, we found that, we found that um, females have more willing to use automated vehicles, also more trust in, 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 in automated vehicles, and also have more uh, environmental concerns in, 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 in uh, uh, regarding also automated vehicles. And they have uh, the conversion groups where like, um, like trusting uh, the vehicles and driving next to automated vehicles. So male have more concern about automated vehicles compared to females. Um, then uh, we have made a reg uh, regression models, uh, including all the categories and also all person characteristics. And we found that only age was uh, um, 
age was uh, one of the factors that have been included in these regression models. A level of education has no, uh, no effect and all other education like air of, uh, uh, air of uh, number of years of driving, this number of hours driving per week, all these facts that have not, uh, does not have an effect. However, as you can see from the regression model, the age has uh, a negative, uh, a negative factor. So as the age increase, we are expecting the willing to use AVs will decrease. So we are expecting that the young driver are more willing to drive automated vehicles comparing with all the drivers. So, um, and uh, I will talk about this one later, but if we, we want to target some um, some audience and in, 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 in a campaign to, to um, to promote automated vehicles and the use of automated vehicles in the future, or any smart cities or any uh, connected communication between vehicles and, and, and the infrastructure, we might need to focus more on these other people. And uh, we found that uh, a willing to use does increase with increase of trust, does increase with uh, being a tech savvy, and does increase with uh, the conversion. So um, significant correlation was about uh, 68%. And also we did um, uh, an ANN models, um, and AI models, so machine learning models to, to um, determine uh, and study more uh, the relationship between all these uh, factors and see what's the effect on uh, and, uh, on trusting uh, automated vehicles and acceptance of automated vehicles. So um, we divide our data in, in, in three uh, data, data sets. The first data set was 50% for training, and we had like 25% for validation and 25% for testing. And the AI model was uh, used uh, was developed using uh, some gradient and uh, back, back progression uh, algorithm to estimate the weights for these models. We found there is a, cor a correlation about seventy percent, seventy five percent between the actual and the predicted values for for the training set and validation data set. And that of the test uh, was about 69%. Uh, the MABE and MSE for the model was 10.34% 10, 10. Uh, and, and 0.23 for training and validation database. And their values were about um, were 10.16% and 0, and 0 0.5 and for data set. And um, we ha also have analyzed uh, what we call it. Um, um, the, the, the different factors that uh, might affect and, and uh, the willing to use, um, as we can see, um, we have used the ratio and important index and have found that um, the most critical factor that affect, uh, affect that was conversion, trust, age, being tick savvy, and, um, and also they where these factors have the highest euro, uh, euro ratio important uh, index. However, there is some relative importance uh, and uh, that can bear a uh, that, uh, that can bear, but however, have lower importance, for example, like uh, females, the experience, education, and environmental concern. And however, I would, I would conclude our result with these uh, this uh, this uh, these conclusions, and um, and as a conclusion, our study uh, focused on investigation factor that affect the acceptance of AV in Saudi Arabia, and the result uh, of its descriptive, uh, descriptive analysis show that majority of participants believe that uh, using AV will decrease the risk of uh, of involvement uh, in in a car uh, in uh, car crashes, and will enable them to reach their destination safely. And also, um, the correlation analysis show that willing and trust are linked with perception that AV are more comfortable than conventional vehicles. And as you can have seen that female drivers favor uh, AVs more than conventional vehicles in terms of trust, environment, environment concern, and willing to use. And as I said, age might affect decision related to AVs and auto driver may not uh, very willing to use the AV. So our recommendation of, of, of 
if we can have a awareness campaign and target these uh, to to these uh, to be targeted this population that might require for border acceptance for technology, being older, being a male, it is expected that you will be uh, less favor of uh, using AV uh, and also um, finding some test drive. Uh, drives uh, during the campaigns. And uh, there is some news that this has been published that um, the acceptance of automated vehicles uh, after using it, for example, uh, we have seen some uh, technology like um, vehicles that we see it now in the field, like Tesla. Um, they say that some study have test their acceptance before and after driving uh, these vehicles and they found their their acceptance has increased actually after um, uh, after um, using these vehicles. So acceptance is, is not the fixed numbers, it's, it, it will develop with the time, develop with the using um, um, using uh, these vehicles. As you can see, have seen in, in the vaccination, um, people have started not trusting the vaccination, but with, uh, as we can have seen, like a lot of number is on vaccination and taking the vaccination, we have seen a lot of people more and more and more are, are taking it. So it uh, develop with the time and um, and to revolve and um, it, it will influence uh, the driver, uh, travel, uh, traveler perspective. Thank you so much. I hope my presentation was not, um, it was short and yeah, to the point, so yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fadi. Thank you, Dr. Fahim. Thank you so much. It was really a good presentation. Uh, we have a few questions, uh, three questions, actually. Uh, the first one is, uh, what is the use of the validation set? Oh, OK. Um, that's a really interesting point. So uh, using validation test, um, let's go back. Uh, it's about uh, the, A, uh, the AN models and um, yes. Um, so 50% um, of, of, of our results, we use it um, just for training. So um, we're showing that this is what should be if your age, um, if your age is this and you drive an hour, this is, this is uh, that you, this is what's gonna be your acceptance of of of, of automated vehicles. So um, that's for training um, training data sets. Then um, we use the validation to um, sorry. Um, Use the validation to validate this point. This uh, data set. So it's a more an A and N. Technical models, AI models, and yeah. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Another, the second question here is about uh, it's from Doctor Ahmed. Uh, he is asking about what do we expect in other cities or uh, or at uh, whole kingdom level. He is saying that I, I, study was yeah. restricted restricted to Riyadh. Uh, what do we expect for other cities or the whole kingdom? I, I totally agree with him. Um, Riyadh could not, I may not be um, a good representation for the whole kingdom. Uh, we might, um, we might have different perspective uh, in, in north and south. And and as I believe, and as we have seen, driving behavior in in, in the Mam and Eastern region is a way different than Riyadh. It's a way different than the, the, the north and south. Um, yeah, uh, we. Uh, we might need to have um, a study that for the, the whole kingdom, but as a good representation, Riyadh could might be one. But uh, precisely, you know, um, we might have, uh, we might expect um, have a different perspective. And for example, like in the south, and always I uh, give um, south region, we have like um, mountains and. Um, People may trust their driving um, or manual driving more than ABs or testing this. So they might think that. So, yeah, that's, that's a good question, actually. Okay, uh, I think we have more time. Let's uh, go over all the questions. The third one is what do we need in uh, SA to adopt AV? In Saudi Arabia. 
Yes. Uh, USA could be Saudi Aramco too, by the way. Um, no, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> okay, in Saudi Arabia. So um, we need a lot of things, actually. Um, and and, and um, I have talked to Sami about it before. Uh, we need, um, we have seen some good examples from, uh, from other presenter um, that, um, the need of the smart cities and the need. However, to the point, uh, we need to develop our infrastructure in, in, in Saudi Arabia in a such a way to, to be ready for automated vehicles. And, I, and, and all I have always called about that. We need to prepare our infrastructure for that. And uh, Mr. Khawaja too have, have, uh, have presented and um, how the, uh, the company that he worked in, in have collected some data. I'm not sure that we have collected some data in Saudi Arabia. I'm not sure that our Tesla and other companies have collected some data. We have either we help them or we have a local companies that help to collect these data. Uh, data. Um, we don't have. It. I'm not sure about it. We have a different environment. We have uh, we have sandstorms. Um, we have uh, uh, we have camels. I'm not sure camels have. Uh, these softwares have uh, identified camels before and um, uh, in the road and uh, camels uh, crashes are have high proportion here in Saudi Arabia. So um, that's one thing we we have to balance between the two. We have to uh, improve our uh, infrastructure in such a way, um, make our automated vehicles or autonomous vehicles ready for uh, for our infrastructure uh, for our road and helping these different companies uh, to adapt to the environment that we have here. Um, autonomous vehicles is not about vehicles that drive by itself. And um, we have different terms. We have what you call autonomous vehicles, like Tesla, we call it autonomous vehicles that um, drive by itself. But we have some another terminology was called uh, automated to connected vehicles that connect this vehicle to other vehicles and infrastructure. So if we don't have enough link or enough um, uh, um, uh, uh, infrastructure that ready for these kinds of such uh, vehicles like connected vehicles, we are not ready. Thank you, Doctor. The last question here, uh, I think the deployment of AV will require improving the geometry of roads network from cost point of view. Does the existing road networks will accommodate these modifications? Sorry, again, what's the question? He's saying that uh, deploying of uh, autonomous vehicles will require improving the geometry of roads. This question is from cost point of view. Uh, I will accommodate uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, does the net existing road networks will accommodate these modifications? Uh, thank you, uh, Sam. Thank you so much. Um, um, we have to take this, uh, this point. Uh, Divide this question in two points. Um, uh, I, 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 um, I always have a funny example about automated vehicles. So if I draw um, a white lane um, around the automated vehicles, we'll consider the, the automated vehicle will consider this a lane or what, and how is it gonna go past this, uh, past this white circle lane? Um, if we're going to talk about Saudi Arabia, not from particular view, review, uh, point of view, our infrastructure are devolving, but slowly, but however, it's devolving. Uh, however, are these devolving, uh, devolving of infrastructure are accommodating these AVs? Uh, it is not. So um, uh, from co cost point of view, um, uh, I think saying of, if we take an example of Tesla and US, um, um, we could um, um, we could see it is it is um, it it work enough, but I'm not sure if we it, if, uh, as a big adaptation it, it will work um, as good. So. All these questions need to be answered, but I'm not sure. I, I don't have like a good really answer to all of these. Okay, thank you, Dr. Brahim. Thank you so much. I think we have no more questions. I will leave the floor to Dr. Sam.
Uh, Dr. Brahim, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Dr. Khala, thank you for moderating this. Yeah, I have a question, in fact, for you. You know, in, in the center, we have a psychologist, uh, part of our researcher, uh, and uh, we wanted to tackle some of these issues that you are bringing here. Uh, we tend to focus on the technology and on numbers, but we forget about the human side of it. Um, so what do you see in terms of effort that we need to do in, ter in, in, uh, uh, in changing some of uh, maybe cultural aspect towards mobility uh, or maybe kind of habits that we have uh, in order to make sure that, first of all, the people are no longer uh, reluctant from adopting the uh, technology and also they can use it in a uh, in, uh, in smart manner. Um, just to tell me, I think to answer your questions, um, as I said, we have a role like bottom up, um, top down. So something come from experience, some come something from uh, the knowledge that they, uh, they we give to the, um, to, uh, to the user or the people. Um, acceptance is, is, is uh, of technology or something cannot come in overnight. Um, it, it might take a while. So, um, so it is, um, it is a math uh, matters for all uh, stakeholders. So the government has to do something. Car manufacturer has to do something uh, in, in terms of uh, vehicle acceptance and how to make uh, people ready for it, and uh, how safe to uh, uh, how safe um, to uh, to use it. So. Um, to, to be honest, to Sami, um, it does need um, the cooperation for all, for all, um, yeah, car, uh, stakeholders. So, um, yeah. If I have answered your question, I understand. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Thank you for uh, this excellent presentation. Um, Right now, uh, we are supposed to go to the panel discussion. <clears throat> and in the panel discussion, we have uh, Dr. Ansar from Belgium. I'm just going to add him uh, right now. He's with us. All right. And Dr. Uh, Mazhar, is Dr. Mazhar with us still? Um, so, alaikum. alaykum, I'm here. Uh, Dr. Ansar, how are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, let me see if the two panelists are with us. Uh, trying to check if they are here right now. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Ansar is here. Dr. Mazhar is not here. We cannot see him the... Panel, uh, in the panelist list, and also Dr. Fuja Yahya. Let me check, there they are. Hello, Assalamualaikum. Yep. Waalaikum salam. I think I'm in the panel discussion box, I guess. Yep, all right, Dr. Masa is here and I'm waiting for Mr. Yahya. We still have one minute, so we will wait for them uh, to join. Up.
Uh, Dr. Nahed, uh, is it okay for you to join the panel discussion? Maybe we did not share with you the questions uh, before, but they are very generic. It, will it be possible for you to join? Dr. Nahed? Uh, absolutely, I'll try my best. Excellent. Uh, so let's uh, start then. Um, just give me one second. I think I have uh, uh, Dr. Brahim. Can you unshare the uh, your presentation? All right. So uh, we have the right now uh, the three panelists: uh, Dr. Nahed, uh, Dr. Mazhar, and uh, Dr. Ansar. Uh, Dr. Nahed will be presenting for us tomorrow, uh, about an interesting uh, presentation about non-metallic uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, I maybe should give a very quick uh, presentation of Dr. Nahad. Uh, uh, Dr. Nahad is the Chief Technologist Officer of Research Products Development Company, RPDC. And uh, uh, he's, uh, uh, this company is subsidiary of Tapnia. Uh, and uh, prior to that, he was Executive Director for Robotics Center at Stanford Research Institute. Uh, it's one of the major world's major centers of research in robotics, artificial intelligence. And uh, Dr. Sutki has over 30 years of technical and management experience in innovative advanced research and development programs that invent, apply, and commercialize systems to solve real world problems. Uh, so prior to joining SRI, uh, Dr. Sitki had executive and technical management position at Oris Surgical Robotics, uh, Lido Psych Defense Advancement Research Project Agency, DARPA, uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense High Performance Computing Agency, uh, sorry, Modernization Program, and U.S. Army Fort Belvoir Research. Development and Engineering Center, Dr. Sitki was named a LIDOS Technical Fellow and has received numerous awards, including uh, the LIDOS Achievement Award for Excellence in Science and Technology. Uh, the SAIC Aspire Award for Achievement Strategic Vision, Passion, Innovation, and Responsiveness. Uh, the SAIC Achievement Award for Excellence in Science and Technology. Uh, Assistant Secretary of uh, the Army for Research and Development, uh, RD and A, Dr. Gilbert Decker Award and the Department of the Army Scientific and Technology Achievement Awards. Dr. Sitki received an MS degree in civil engineering from the University of Petersburg and PhD in mechanical engineering and intelligent control from the Catholic University of America. Um, so Dr. Sitki will be uh, talking to us tomorrow about uh, the Saudi Arabia Smart and Metallic uh, Autonomous Vehicles. Uh, so tomorrow again, we will go inshallah over some of his curriculum. Uh, Dr. Ansar just joined us right now. Dr. Ansar Yasser is a professor at the Trans uh, Transportation Research Institute, IMOB in Belgium. Uh, he, this center is the one of the top European institutes focusing on the broader themes of road safety and transport management using new modes of mobility. Uh, Professor Yasser is a senior member IEEE fellow at BCS and Europe Engineering uh, at IMOB. He worked uh, on the European FP7 project that has seen from 2011-2014 uh, European Era Dashnet uh, Smart uh, PT from 2014 2017, Age 2020 Track and No 1820, and Age 2020 Ice uh, Icecape 16 to 19 project. He's currently responsible for the Age 2020 Research and Rescue project uh, up to 2000, uh, up to 2023 with a consortium of several international partners. is responsible for the intelligent transport system and intelligent topics and transportation courses for the masters of transportation science student and related research around the topic at uh, uh, UHASL, uh, University of Hassel. Furthermore, he is currently the head of the business development unit at the Institute focusing on several applications including SAIF routes at school and safety tracking system. 
so Dr. Yasser has a broader research uh, interest, including smart cities and communities connected intelligent mobility, drone system management, road safety using smart transportation solutions and mobility management. As a part of his basic research, he has expertise in modeling pedestrian flow using various IoT based te techniques and simulation tools such as VizWalk. Uh, he was super, he has supervised, sorry, several uh, master and PhD students on the topic of transportation and pedestrian modeling using infused ITS techniques. Uh, so, Dr. Yasser will uh, also go through his bio tomorrow. He will be talking about the role of UAVs in smart city traffic management safety and enforcement. This will be uh, tomorrow. Dr. Mazhar has presented for us and we present, uh, presented him for you uh, in the morning. But just to remind you, he's the Senior Vice President Technology and Innovation at Team in Saudi Arabia and Head of the Fair Application Center. Uh, today we are looking for uh, smart mobility and we are trying to, uh, uh, Dr. Yahya is with, uh, Mr. Yahya is with us also. Are you hearing me, Mr. Yahya? Hello, Yahya? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Great. All right, uh, Yahya also presented this morning and then uh, uh, he uh, talked, he is uh, advisor to the, in the Ministry of Energy. Uh, we presented him to you this morning too. So there are a few questions that uh, I, uh, that we prepared, in fact, uh, for this. I'm going to share the screen so the audience can see the questions at the same time. And then uh, we can uh, look to our uh, panelists and try to answer uh, some of them. Um, do you see the uh, the questions? Clear? Hello? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, so what I will uh, ask uh, the audience, maybe uh, not the audience, sorry, the panelists, Dr. Mazhar, Dr. Ansar, Dr. Sitki, and then uh, Mr. Yahya, just to put the camera on so people can uh, see who is the one answering the questions at a particular time. If your system supports this, of course. Are you hearing me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you and see you, Dr. Sami. All right, then uh, Dr. Ansar and the Mr. Yahya and Dr. Setki, if you can put the camera on. If you can, huh? All right, so the first question that we have, and then we jump directly to the meat of this, is the following. What are the changes in mobility slash transportation that will allow people to commute more efficiently, uh, more cheaply, and more often in, in different ways? Right? So this is a general question. I will ask uh, maybe all the panelists to give us uh, their ideas about this. So we can start with uh, Dr. Mazhar. Yes, um, thank you very much. So, um, so this really is a, a good question. We all want to cheap faster and cheaper, right? Um, yes. And also with a lower carbon footprint as well. Um, and, the, and the question is, um, you know, how do we do this? In Riyadh, for example, we just spent $25 billion on building six or seven, um, you know, lines, um, you know, the, the, the metro, for example, right? So that certainly is, um, in the long term, it's cheap. It's a good investment. Um, but one of the other things that we should be looking at, um, and of course, this is where technology um, will play a role. Um, for example, vertical transport um, using drones for the movement of people. Um, airships, for example, they may be a bit slow, but they're certainly very, um, let's say, reliable and low energy. So I think these are the, and of course, electric vehicles, um, shared mobility, um, certainly shared mobility with the advent of autonomous um, cars or vehicles and um, certainly will play a role um, in the future as well. I mean, even me personally, my next car, I don't really want to buy a car anymore. Um, I mean, if, if I did, I'd like to buy an electric vehicle, but um, I would be ha quite happy with a, with a shared vehicle that's autonomous, right? So I can use it when I need it. And um, that would work for me. So that would certainly reduce the cost. And if there's enough demand for this, then I guess 
um, it'll also be more um, more efficient. And of course, and the other benefit will be that we don't we, we won't need to have acres and acres of land in cities devoted to car parking <laughs> and all the time we waste trying to find parking. I was in London last week and you spend half of your time looking for a place to park when you're going for a meeting, for example, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so that so there's um, some some thoughts. Ah, nice, uh, Dr. Ansar. What do you think about this? Uh, I thank you so much. I think I fully agree with uh, Dr. Mazar. What he said is actually we for me uh, what we are trying to also um, foresee is to actually look at the how can we can replace the last mile first of all the commute because the the first mile or the last mile commute is the easiest one to, to transform into more sustainable mode of transport. And as Dr. Mother said, go vertical. I think even if drones are there in the picture and they have to be sustainable and environmental friendly, then we have to look into um, battery powered or electric powered drones or other more uh, environmental friendly fuel drones. And then we are not talking about drones that can fly miles and miles or kilometers and kilometers, but they would be more of like last mile and first mile, even they are also true for the autonomous pods. The other reason behind that is the autonomous vehicles or drones, uh, when you give them autonomy, when you give them more control, uh, then you also face more uncertain um, um, uncertainty as well. For, and I'm, I'm not yeah. talking about uh, between each one of them because they are both rule driven or belief driven but more of uh, uh, problems problems can occur more from the side of, um, for, for instance, the human drivers. So that's why in this domain, the biggest challenge these days to, to tackle the mobility future demands of, of people commute is to deal with mixed traffic reality. And, and I think mixed traffic reality is, is a very difficult challenge to handle because the vehicles are so intelligent uh, to a point that they can only, I mean, they can learn based on what they see so we cannot, as long as we cannot put them in all kinds of possible scenarios, there would always be a problem, a point of failure for them, regardless of the fact of whether they are drones, uh, whether they are autonomous vehicles. But I do agree with also Dr. Maza when he explained me about his, his future vision, he won't like to buy an electric car or no car. I would actually still go for no car because I mean, this is another discussion that electric vehicles, uh, as long as the, we don't look at the, the tank to wheel uh, and, and, and the emission from the whole supply chain, uh, we, are, we are ignoring somewhat, you know, the, the fact that, okay, we are making more, uh, our commute more cheaper or more environmental friendly or more sustainable, but uh, are we trying to do this by pushing uh, the bad side of it to another domain and say, saying that it's not our problem anymore? Um, so I see this in, in, in different ways, but to start off with, we need to really try to, as 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 uh, the fact, try to reduce the ownership of the of the cars in general and focus more on sharing. Because if I look in anybody who is here, most of our cars, especially the pandemic, has proven this point more and more that the vehicles drive for a fraction of of your time during the day, and the rest of the time they stand still, do nothing. Uh, actually produce costs um, or, and also take parking space and so on. Uh, so if, wh what if we can all share them and, they, and this is easier when, when vehicles become even more autonomous. So uh, yeah. I think that's, that's what I, I would like to propose. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Nahad, uh, this mixed reality and also ca carpooling and uh, uh, maybe uh, micro mobility. Uh, how do you see what type of technology, for example, what type of uh, modes KSA can adopt? This was one question that was in the audience before. So you you may answer this question, but in your answer, please try to uh, include this in your uh, in your answer. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, I totally agree with the two gentlemen uh, uh, about uh, share mobilities. Uh, but I just want to echo one thing here. You know, uh, uh, I'm new to the Saudi Arabia. I mean, I spent most of my, you know, the last 40 years in the U.S., mainly in the Silicon Valley and the Virginia area. Uh, so there's a new trend we need to really also address uh, in terms of what COVID-19 uh, uh, created. Not not only 
from the sickness level, but also open up another opportunity for a lot of uh, technologies and, 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 and the mindset. Uh, you know, like in the Silicon Valley, I'm going to share with you a few examples that those giant companies, Google, Apple, Amazon, and so forth and so on, they realize the, uh, the telecommuting uh, for, 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 for people to work from home uh, actually produce better quality of work because uh, people, uh, they don't have a stressful uh, uh, commute time, you know, particularly in, 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 in San Francisco area. If you are driving on 101, you know, and you're trying to go from home to, to your office, you spend literally maybe an hour and even if it's like a 10 kilometer or 10 miles uh, distance. So the stress uh, uh, that create on people every mornings, you know, that cause a negative impact on their productivities, okay? Mm. Uh, coming back home from, home from the office, also the stress cause uh, uh, a problem, the families actually, you know, talking about things that they, you know, did not like during the day, whether from the traffic or from work. So the social impact actually uh, caused a lot of problem. So in addition to the shared mobility, I think the telecommuting is going to be the norms in a few years. Uh, right now, I mean, they have, uh, my son works for Apple's, you know, probably 70% of the technical guys, uh, uh, not the sales and the, and, and the stores and, and, and so forth and so on, but the, the technical guys who are, focusing on writing uh, uh, software or, or developing new technology, uh, they spend 80% of their time remotely. And the companies found it very effective way to transition basically uh, from the norms of, you know, having eight to five or nine to four or whatever, uh, people to go to the office and conduct their work. Uh, they found it very efficient uh, that to keep them at home, they're much happier. Okay, it cost them zero dollars in terms of the transportations. They don't car anymore, and there is also uh, an incentive program in the, in the, in the valley. Uh, most companies, small, medium, large, they they give a, an incentive uh, uh, vouchers basically to force people to use the train. You know, so because uh, uh, where I used to work, we used to have one hundred percent transportations. You know. Uh, uh, to cover our, our cost. So, so those kind of elements, uh, encouraging people to not to own a car anymore, <laughs> because car, as uh, the previous speakers uh, mentions, uh, 80%, actually, I don't have the exact numbers, but if you want to equate uh, dollars to miles, you know, if you own a car, it costs so much, you know, from the cost of the car, the gasoline, the maintenance, the insurance, and so forth and so on, uh, and where 80% or maybe 90% of the time the car is sitting in a garage, okay? So again, my, my, my belief, you know, in 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to see more and more people working from home, commuting back and forth to work. Very nice. Uh, Mr. Yahya, you are with us? Uh, he just sent me uh, saying that he got a very urgent matter, so he needed to. Ah, okay, no. Give us. All right. Sami. Uh, Dr. Yes. Barry, go ahead. Yes, yeah. Sami, I, mean, I just want to add a few more thoughts or comments, I guess, on okay. this question. Um, and I think I referred to it briefly in my presentation. I think it's very important that we as a society begin to look at, uh, and, it's, it's, and it's not a new thing, um, underground transport. Um, especially here um, in the kingdom or in the region, um, it makes a, lo a, a lot of sense for many reasons. Number one, the weather, right? Um, outdoor mm. mobility is not comfortable, really, right? Um, when it's mm. 45 or 50 degrees outside. And, and also, um, you know, mobility underground, whether it's a metro or as Elon Musk is trying to do with the boring company in California, promoting, you know, how cars and um, electrical vehicles simply go underground and underground tunnels. So you can drive literally underground um, on like some kind of a platform um, from destination to destination, from point to point. Um, so I think we should be looking at these models here in the kingdom, this mixed modality of underground transportation, um, and not only for supply chain, but also for moving around in your autonomous vehicle or electrical vehicle, plus the, the standard metro underground system. 
I mean, it really does work. I mean, look at cities like Paris and London. Um, you can move, you know, you know, it's mass transport and it really does work. So you could have mass transport on one on the one hand and personalized transport um, through tunnels in, in, in electrical vehicles. And I think th both of those um, should be um, should be studied. But don't forget the other big thing and the other big need that we have in society is to travel, let's say, from London to Riyadh. Right now, we're still using technology which is over 100 years old and it takes too long, right? And a jumbo jet. So I'm a big fan of what Elon Musk is trying to do in SpaceX to have you know point-to-point -point travel using, ro using rockets. So in theory, you could go from a spaceport in London, or sorry, in New York to Riyadh in 30, in 30 minutes, right? Now, it, it will be a bit of a hairy experience. You, you, you probably will experience a lot of G-force, <laughs> um, but you know, it's, um, I think that really is the future. I think we really need to look at this seriously. I mean, when I still see you know, aircraft going from you know, New York to London and taking 20, you know, 12, 15 hours, that is so bad. I mean, it, for the environment, wasting time, so I really believe that the point-to-point -point rocket travel will be here within the next five years. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, is, is there any question in the audience? Uh, anyone wants to uh, ask any question, please raise your hand and I will give you the microphone. Uh, or, or you can write it if you want on the Q&A or the chat. Just uh, Whatever is easy for you can use, uh, we'll be glad to accommodate this. Uh, right, excellent. So uh, let's go to the next topic then. I asked this question during the presentation of Dr. Mazhar about the digital twin, but this is something related to that. And uh, maybe uh, we start with uh, Dr. Ansar. Uh, would it be possible to simulate and model the future of the future of mobility and transportation, for example, in Saudi Arabia to predict the required changes and plan for making uh, these things happen? Um, my, my short answer to, to begin with is, is, yes, it is absolutely possible. But before we can do that, I think we need to study um, the, the realities of today. Um, by that, I mean, uh, we really need to have very detailed uh, data because in Saudi Arabia, especially for the past recent, in the recent past, uh, we have all witnessed very rapid transition from in, in many disciplines of life. And I'm not going to talk about all of them, but mobility is one of them. Um, but also Saudi Arabia and, and Gulf region in general is a society that is, as we call in, in our part of the world, very bounded to their cars, uh, to their vehicles, because everybody has a sense of, of ownership, sense of pride, but sense of uh, privacy as well. So they, are, they, have, they have to live in a, in a different way. So where uh, ride sharing or, or uh, moving to other modes of, of mobility is sometimes different. So by that, I really, by that I mean, first, we need to understand how the behavior uh, of current mobility patterns within Saudi Arabia work uh, for individual, for each household. And then from the government level, we need to look at the policies that they are you know, um, trying to push into the, uh, to, towards the general public, uh, the future plans and stuff in terms of the infrastructure development that they're looking into. And then, I, of course, by having a very detailed view of your travel activities, uh, by having a very detailed view of your wishes, uh, possible uh, trigger points or nudge points within your um, daily mobility. So you have to look both at the level of, um, you, look, you have to look at all the stakeholders, so both the government and the people, the users who are involved with this, and then try to do uh, short-term planning, which possibly can be more accurate. And by that, I mean five to 10 years, and then go more towards uh, a long-term prediction, because if I may give you an example, because in the Western part of the world, people have been, countries have been doing this transport planning for, for years, and they have been predicting growth and demand and so many other phenomena, and, and thus also making policies, making uh, infrastructural uh, plans, development plans around that demand, around that mix, trying to optimize it. But one thing that they forget by while doing that is, it is very hard sometimes in long-term planning to predict things such as the pandemic that we recently encountered. So where all the plans, whatever mobility plans what we already made or simulations that we made or models that we made simply came to, uh, came to a halt. Uh, everything completely paused to cease to exist. 
Um, so those things are hard to predict, but of course, if everything goes um, as planned and as predicted, as hoped, as wished for, then it's easier to predict. Uh, but also we do not need to create a model now and say, oh, it will be fit for the next 20, next 50 years. But at certain, uh, I would say windows of time, like every five years, every few other instances within the duration of that model, we need to update the model with more data about other transport modes. Uh, maybe, for example, drones at the moment are not legislated within Saudi Arabia for, for commercial uh, and for passenger use. So once that happens, once that airspace, this, that vertical is fully developed, I think then we need to take this into account within the model to be able to cope up with you know the complete planning and, and uh, prediction um, abilities that the model has uh, today. So that is certainly in short, a prediction model or a transport model is very important to have to be able to simulate what changes need to be done for the development, for the betterment of the country, but that needs to be updated through expert knowledge, through domain knowledge and so on. So that is also very important to remember. Mm. Dr. Mazhar, do you want to add something, Dr. Nahid? Yeah, uh, I totally agree uh, with him. And uh, also, you know, uh, I've been working in this domain for many, many years, you know, supporting, uh, I work for uh, the Department of Defense and supporting them from the defense contractors. So modeling and simulations, you know, as I know it, you know, for now in terms of, you know, whatever data that you have, whatever assumption that you put in the front, it's not really is gonna give you 100% sort of uh, predictions because there's always, always uh, edge cases, okay? Particularly when it comes to human behaviors, okay? Human behaviors, you know, uh, it varies from hour to hour, depending on the day that you are working with, you know, especially the behaviors of drivers, you know, on the road, you know, sometime, you know, you, you've seen a pattern of drivers doing very well and all of a sudden uh, change behavior for whatever reason, you know, he, he received a phone call with bad news, uh, death in the families or lost his job. And all of a sudden he becomes rage drivers on the road. So how do you simulate that? You know, it's, it's very difficult to, to have a complete uh, a simulation that give you 100% uh, sort of a, a, mod, a, a confidence on the model that you're gonna rely on it. Uh, I know for sure uh, that they are, I heard this morning, uh, the first presenters uh, or, or the second presenter when he talked about the NVIDIA and, and, and other companies that were, they're doing uh, testing. Uh, TRL, Toyota Research Institute uh, was established maybe six, seven years ago, uh, uh, was funded by Toyota uh, companies in Japan and they have a strong present in, 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 in the United States they have three offices in Detroit, uh, Boston area, and, and the Silicon Valley. So they they're taking a totally different approach for the autonomous vehicle. Uh, their approach was, uh, well, we're gonna be simulating because a human, you know, uh, as far the, the, the cognitions and the behaviors, we have a billion years of evolutions. You know, we, we process things is totally different than a computer process, right? So what they, the, they took a totally different approach of uh, designing their autonomy. Uh, they've been doing a lot of modeling and simulations for the last five, six years. And the results so far is not really compelling to, to, to claim that the, the next autonomous vehicle will be on the street. One example that I will give you, I'll share with you guys, that you are driving in a car and you see a tree in front of you, okay? And a lady that is pushing a cart with the baby on it, okay? So you have two choices, all right? First choice to avoid the lady and save the, uh, their lives, but you're gonna kill yourself hitting the trees. Or the second choice is that you save your life, but you're gonna be end up killing the. So how are you gonna process and making the right decision in a split of a second? Those kind of things it's very hard to simulate and build a model on them. So yeah. yes, modeling and simulation is good, but to some extent. You know, so we need to rely on actual data uh, that can uh, build a reliable model for whatever we are doing in terms of the AI and the autonomous mobility.
Great. So if I understood correctly, there are two maybe scopes of modeling, the long term and the short term. And then we need to be able to differentiate that the answer uh, is not in one model. It could be in different models. Um, I have one question from Rama. Maybe you can uh, let me unmute him because uh, Rama, you can you can you can talk. You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Could you hear yeah, my ahead. voice? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation for all the speakers and also the moderators. I am Rama. Just recently graduated from. Uh, civil and environmental engineering from KBPM. Uh, sorry, because I uh, don't follow since the beginning full, fully. I just wa have one question for all the speakers. Do you have any idea, I mean, what country or city that can uh, be a role model for Saudi Arabia to, uh, to implement smart city and also to have good integration of mass transportation? Yes. All right. Uh, okay, it's not directly related to the question that we are asking right now, but if any one of you can take one less than one minute to answer this question. Uh, I think everybody is trying to do his effort in many countries, but which one is leading right now? Maybe the picture is not clear, right? Mm. If I, sorry, Dr. Mazza, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, so before I answer this question, I just want to pick up a point that Dr. Um, Ansar mentioned. Um, so in Saudi Arabia, I mean, I think people here were used to rights sharing um, for quite a while. If you remember before women could drive here, um, they were using, you know, Kareem, Uber, or private drivers. So in fact, women in this country, half the population were already using ride sharing <laughs> for many, many years, right? Um, and, and the men, of course, were not used to this whatsoever. I mean, they wanted to have their own car and their own privacy, but women have, are used to ride sharing. So I think the ride sharing model works here very well. And I think it has a great future um, here um, in the kingdom, when, whether, it's, whether it's existing cars or autonomous vehicles or virtual mobility. So I think that's a, that's a given. Um, regarding the question that the, the, I think Rama just presented, yeah, I mean, there are many good models um, of smart cities around the world, Singapore, Tokyo, um, Paris, I mean, lots of cities say they're smart cities. Um, I would turn the question on its head. I would say um, perhaps in the next few years, maybe places like Neom and Red Sea will be taking the lead and other countries will follow because there's a really, re really new and original thinking happening um, here at the moment um, in terms of mobility and logistics. Um, and I think there's an opportunity for Saudi Arabia to actually lead the thought leadership um, and, and, and addressing the challenges of smart logistics, transportation, um, you know, sustainable logistics. So I think this is happening here as we speak. And I hope in the next few years, Saudi Arabia will lead the, the discourse in this area. Um, Is that something? Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to carry on on what uh, Dr. Mazat said, and he's, he's, he, he has hit the right note. I would say uh, to Rama, the Rama, don't look at other countries' models because each country's model was built for a, a specific purpose. And I've been saying this for over the years I've been teaching, as long as I've been teaching, try to look at the needs of your own citizens and own population because each region, each city has its very unique set of the needs. And I think why not Saudi Arabia can be the, the global leader or actually the regional leader in smart mobility in itself. Um, so I think you can take the best practices in different things, but no, do not try to copy and paste. Very good. Um, and for example, Dr. Ansar, I mean, I would like, I mean, I, I, a very good way to test a lot of the new technology, I think would be for what I call the, the three cities in the Western coast, Jeddah, Mecca, Medina. So there, there's Absolutely. a very unique model, and that's a very unique model where um, new innovation, shared mobility, would really make a big impact um, on the user experience of um, people going for tourism, for um, Umrah, for Hajj, right? Um, so there, there's a need, there's a demand, and there's an opportunity to test and trial and pilot a lot of these technologies there, um, and I think it'll be very unique. I think. Absolutely. Nice. Um, <clears throat> 
I will start with Dr. Nahid this time. Uh, what are the smart technology needed for making uh, public and uh, private threat system, for example, faster, more efficient? We are, we are talking about threat system, but I would like you to look at it from mobility side, uh, more efficient within urban areas and with, between cities. So you're gonna steal my thunder for tomorrow, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll give you a taste of it, all right? So what, all right. We, what you're gonna hear tomorrow is that uh, the technology that we are building right now, uh, not only focus on the, uh, the autonomous uh, vehicle capability itself, we are relying a lot on the, uh, the smart city infrastructure, Okay, I support NEOMs on multiple projects as well, so I'm not going to go into that room there. But, you know, keep in mind, you know, smart city, not even fully smart, you know, uh, like, like that, for example, every corner in Riyadh, you see a lot of traffic light with cameras. So those cameras, okay, uh, are not fully utilized to the level of the individual vehicle. They are utilized for the command and control to monitor accidents or violations or whatever. Imagine, imagine the data that these sensors are collecting can be shared directly into the autonomous vehicle. So you will have much better uh, a view of the world and the perception Ooh. system and building the world model that will allow the autonomy, the planning, the navigations to run more robustly. So. Again, I'm not going to go a lot over this because tomorrow is going to be the middle of the talk in terms of vehicle, vehicle communication, vehicle to X vehicle communication, vehicle to city communication. That is going to really uh, enrich the, the, the capability of the autonomous system. Because right now, the status quo, I mean, again, tomorrow you'll hear more. Uh, there are 49 companies pouring billions of dollars into these technologies, but they're focused only on their you know, individual uh, sensing capability, the computing capability, the AI capability within the, the vehicle itself. So mm -hmm. what we are trying to put Saudi Arabia on the on the map to, to take advantage of what SNIAM is doing, what's other uh, project, uh, like there is a, uh, the, uh, uh, the Velocity, there's another mega project within Saudi Arabia focusing on electric and autonomous vehicles called the velocity so so those are multiple programs that they're going to be really uh, uh, sort of drawing the the blueprint of of the uh, autonomous vehicle to take advantage of the external uh, uh, technologies and sensings and capability uh, so you will hear some more about that tomorrow but that's in a nutshell looking forward to that yes yeah. any comment from uh, Dr. Ansar or Dr. Mazhar? Yes, I have a few comments. Um, I agree with the previous speaker. I mean, um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of sensors out there already, and there are, and we can of course install more sensors, and cars will also generate more data. And to me, what's missing is a common unified interoperable platform, right? Um, so not every company having its own siloed data, um, yeah. and then it's not interoperable um, with the municipality, right? Um, or or a different city. Um, how do we have a unified um, sort of interoperable system or a system of systems um, um, that, that is able to be much more intelligent and cognitive, right? Um, and then therefore easier to use. I think that would be a key enabler. Um, you know, that, that whole IT, IT OT interface that I mentioned in my talk, um, how to reduce that friction, how to make it seamless, how to make it low cost and adaptable and cognitive. And I think that's what I think will really, um, um, because for public and private freight systems, you know, data is very important. Um, the last mile we've heard of as well, um, in a real time, re re real time, real time insight, in, you know, when and where your parcel is, for example, or where, where is a truck, um, how long will it take, um, and having sort of a system of depot, big depots, smaller depots. So I think there's a lot of hardware that's needed, but I think a, a very smart um, IoT platform, I think, is also a, a crucial enabler. Of this and of course alongside that goes the modeling and simulation as well to to to, to be more predictive right to um because tomorrow if there's a sandstorm how will it impact <laughs> um the delivery of goods and services right for example or if you know if, if there's snow in tobuk <laughs> um or if yeah. it's a you know big big storm in china 
um, or there's no power in China for the factories, um, that's going to impact everything along the way. So I think we need to have a look at a very intelligent, smart system, um, which I think is, is, is as important as the autonomous vehicles themselves. Very interesting. Yes, agree. Dr. Ansari, you want to add something? Uh, I think um, my colleagues have done a very good job, but I'd just like to add one more, um, more yeah. small, smaller um, factor over here. I think, again, also being very close to that's actually a, a domain that I love. We have the sensors, we have everything, but are we trying to? What are we trying to do with the the, the sustainability factor? Because sustainability is also very important. So, for me. I think majority of, especially if I look at the, in Europe and I, I see these shorter flights, shorter than 500 or a thousand kilometers, and they've been done by these big cargo planes that yeah. can be easily replaced by, by faster, smaller, uh, battery powered or another more fuel uh, or environmental friendly fuel based uh, fixed wings, uh, these drones, high speed drones that is already in action these days in, in Europe to transform how we uh, look at the logistics today, because that it takes a huge chunk of our uh, daily commute, I mean, daily road usage or air usage. And uh, that also contributes very heavily towards factors like congestion, road safety, um, air safety, air congestion, and so on and so forth. So all about mobility. So that is a, also a domain that we need to think about and invest more in, because that doesn't require billions of dollars of investment. Uh, we can still do it with a couple of millions, uh, create a very efficient, um, as I would call it, a drone board based or drone hub based solution where, well, for example, in Saudi Arabia, uh, there could be a several dro uh, dro those several of those ports or those hubs uh, connected connecting the major um, major hubs with the rest of the country. So you reduce the burden on 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 the environment, and you reduce the burden on the traffic congestion and. All, all, the, all the other factors that have been mentioned. And of course, for, to do that, we need technology, we need sensors, we need smartness, we need you know, automation within the process. So that is a definitely a need as well. Very nice. Uh, I think uh, we, we need to have a continuous dialogue and the continuous discussion of many of these challenges and how we can go forward. I really thank you very much for being uh, in this panel discussion. Uh, we have covered only three or four questions out of the list that we have, but with the substantive answers and the uh, very detailed ones. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. And we look forward to Dr. Nahad and Dr. Ansar's presentation tomorrow. Uh, inshallah, uh, we have a program as exciting as today, and uh, we will see you all there. So thank you very much. And uh, we will see you together, inshallah. Tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Right. For the uh, public audience, thank you very much. And we see you tomorrow. Uh, we will have a uh, very interesting presentation for you. Thank you very much, all. We end today with this. Thank you.